Good morning, everyone, and hopefully you can all hear me nice and clearly and see me as well. Uh, my name is Greg Lurz, and I'm basically going to be your compare or host for the event and also one of the speakers later today. I just want to say thank you very much for attending and for joining promptly as well. I can see there's a lot of interesting debate and discussion in the chat over everyone's favourite biscuits. Um, I don't know where I fall on the Jaffa cake debate in that respect. Just to run through a little bit of housekeeping and then actually set up our first speaker of the day. As you hopefully are aware from the emails, today's event is going to be recorded and made available afterwards. Um, as we go through the events as well, what I'm going to be inviting you to do is to use the chat. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask any of the speakers today or the panel of speakers in the question and answer at the end, please do share it in the chat. What we're going to be doing during the event is pulling all those questions out of the chat so we've got them ready at the end that we can then put to the different speakers. If we are unable to actually answer your specific question that you do put in the chat, there is a survey at the end where you can submit the question afterwards and we can hopefully get an answer to there as well. So please, as we go through the event, as you are listening to the excellent speakers we've got, please do put any comments, questions into the chat. Please have discussion there. Any questions we'll be picking out and we'll be pointing to the panel at the end with the question and answer. Um, in terms of setting up today's event then, so finding your voice, developing a distinctive personality on social media. I'm really excited that we've got a great panel of speakers today talking about their respective social media accounts and their own approaches to running them. One of the things that I think is going to hopefully come out of this event is that there isn't one single way of running a social media account, whether that's Twitter, Instagram, Facebook or TikTok, even if you're feeling particularly adventurous these days. And so whether you do run an account for yourself, whether you're just interested in libraries and social media, or you're just a fan of libraries and some of the great work that the speakers they do on their respective social media accounts, hopefully there's going to be something in the different talks and the question and answer today that you can take out of it. So to get the ball moving, get things moving along. I'm really excited to introduce our first speaker then, which is Natalie Rees from Manchester Metropolitan University Library, whose talk's going to be, there's no I in team, but there is in Manchester Met Library. So I'm gonna pass over to Natalie now. Hi everyone. So I'm Natalie I'm from Manchester Met. Uh, my main role at Manchester Met is a cataloguing and systems assistant librarian, but I also manage the social media team and post myself. I'm going to start with giving you a small glimpse at some of the members of our social media team. So there's just some of my lovely colleagues. Um, so for a bit of context to begin with, we started posting on Twitter in March 2011 with just a few colleagues and a library services manager in charge. At the top, you can see our super exciting first ever tweet, scintillating. It wasn't deemed particularly important, just something that we should be seen as doing as others in the academic world were. Our account was so dull and it was mainly used as a way of letting users know that certain databases weren't working or that systems were down. All messages were basically negative or just very, very unappealing. A team was then created later that year, but it was still seen as more important to just be signposting news items rather than injecting any personality into the posts. Team members were also told not to reply to any queries or comments coming through. Eventually, the manager was persuaded that it was really important to respond to questions and the team was expanded to deal with queries and to post more regularly. 
At that point, we could do our research and start to de develop our own voice and personality. We looked at what other libraries were doing, what sort of tone they used. We tried to get a feel for what people could get away with in terms of humour while still being informative and relevant. We didn't want to copy anyone else's style. I mean, everyone would love to be Liverpool. There's lots of fangirling from today's speakers, but it's just so original and you need to find your own way. For us, it was important that staff were trained on good practice so that there was always a capacity to have a variety of voices, but still a consistent message throughout the week. Twitter was still relatively new, so staff weren't necessarily using it personally. And then at that point, when everyone was more comfortable tweeting, we could start adding humour. And that really came from the individuals rather than us all just getting together and trying to brainstorm what might be funny. It has to feel natural and not at all forced. And that's why you need to pick your team carefully. It's also trial and error, which I think it always is. Your funniest joke might get no reaction whatsoever. So you just dust yourself off and try something else later. And then from there, Facebook account soon followed. And a few years later, we started on Instagram. Now, recruiting team members, I'm asked as part of people's inductions to talk to our newbies about social media and how we post. I can gauge interest and find out perhaps if they've used social media in previous roles. If they look completely bored throughout, you know they're not the ones to recruit. Sometimes staff can approach me asking to join the team and we can call on them when we have a vacancy. They may have started following us and liked what they've seen or a colleague might suggest that they'd be a good fit. Some staff have come forward after years of working in Manchester Met and have tried, some have tried and decided it's just not for them. It's not always the loudest colleagues either that volunteer, which I absolutely love. And you see their personality develop as the weeks go by. They become that little bit braver in their posting. I always recommend just reading what other people have posted on our Twitter account that past week so they can see our general tone of voice and what's worked in terms of engagement or likes. I still do this and it makes me step up my game when I see others posting really great content. And if people make excellent use of GIFs, then I am just very happy. I always give new team members our library social media guidelines, which are mostly common sense, but they offer an idea of what's not acceptable. Now, I'm sorry for this very boring slide, but it is important. Uh, the main pointers are it's not your own personal account and it's definitely not the place to air your grievances with the institution or another company or person. You always have to remember that you're representing the library and the la university and our main purpose is to offer information and advertise our services to our followers. But within these guidelines, there is an awful lot of freedom on what we can post. There are stricter rules for posting on the university's main account, as you did imagine, and this captures a wider audience, of course, made up of students, potential students and their parents, stakeholders and wider community. Little old us mostly need to appeal to our current students, academics and our colleagues at other libraries and institutions that like a laugh. We can be much less formal than our main university account, and we've been told several times that they're jealous of the freedoms that we have to post as we do, as do other departments in the university. We've been asked to do takeovers of the main university Instagram account via stories. So this could be to celebrate something like Read a Book Day or for something happening in the library, such as a Meet the Author event. It's meant that we could keep our own voice. Um, that's why we've been asked to do it, but we're able to reach a much wider audience and the university has many more followers than we do. So we're always happy to do this as it's great promotion for our channels, as well as shining a light on what we're posting about and what we're all about in the library. For all our freedom, it doesn't mean that we can go too crazy and the team is reminded of the guidelines when perhaps something too political or topical has been posted. But in the years I've been looking after the team, I've only ever had to delete about two or three posts. However, I did get um, an irate phone call once from someone at Oak Furniture Land because one of our team tweeted that the library was open except to those annoying people on the advert. I'm not quite sure what possessed him to be quite so sp specific. So if you don't take anything away from this presentation than this, remember to never mess with Oak Furniture Land because they will find you. As for the day-to-day -day running, we have nine people on Twitter including weekends. Some days we have someone covering in the morning, someone else in the afternoon due to commitments. Um, on Instagram, we have three and one on Facebook. I cover all three and I am that one Facebook poster as the account is linked to my own personal account, which is really quite annoying Facebook rule about business pages. We don't focus too many of our efforts on Facebook these days. But that's not to say it should be ignored and left dormant. We still get quite a lot of views on our posts, even if that doesn't get much interaction and it still appears quite high up in our Google search for the library. 
We tend to post our main messages and events via Facebook rather than the more everyday chattier posts that we might use on Twitter or Instagram. It's great that we have a mixture of staff from all grades and different roles within the library. It brings a different perspective to our accounts. If it was only backroom staff posting, it would become very dry very quickly. You need staff members who see things happening in the library, on the help desk, and who are interacting more with users and the book stock. Straightening with a keen eye can help pick out amusing titles of books, for example, and evening shifts can be a good time to bounce ideas off other colleagues. It also means any queries coming through can be dealt with more efficiently if we have a wider range of knowledge within the team. During lockdown, we gained a library comms and engagement officer, who's here today, um, who can offer a wider view of university news and events. It means now that we have someone across all library communications, and this then feeds into our social media content. We have a calendar of events and campaigns, so team members have guidance about what needs mentioning on Twitter and Instagram that day or week, but in their own style. We're then also aware of campaigns run by other departments of the university who'd like us to support them with reposts or shares, and they can do the same for us. It's also good to have freedom to react to things that maybe are trending on Twitter at that moment. I mean, who wouldn't want to jump on the Jackie Weaver or Bernie Sanders bandwagon like we did? And finally, I'm getting to the reason for my title. There's no I in team, but there is in Manchester Met Library. Not as a particularly conscious decision to begin with, and it's definitely something that has evolved over time. It's that we post as I rather than we. We don't go as far as saying, oh, hi, it's Natalie posting today. Uh, but we do post as ourselves rather than one voice, especially on Twitter. You might not know it's several people tweeting necessarily over the week, and I think we've done well to keep a consistent tone, but you can gauge our interests from our individual posts. It's much more human. I personally have a deep and enduring love for Mr. Paul Rudd. If I can get it working. Um, I like to celebrate his birthday each year and use gifts throughout the day. Um, and throughout the year. I can't get it to work. That's, oh, there we go, Mr. Paul Rudd. Um, this has resulted actually in people tweeting Paul Rudd news to us. Uh, so when he had a new Netflix show, we had someone to come and tell us that uh, this was the case and people reply with their own Rudd based gifts. I like this man. Um, so someone actually said that we were becoming a Paul Rudd stan account, which I'm fine with. And it's clear that it's not just me that um, loves Paul Rudd and it sparks interaction with people. We're basically geeks. I won't dwell on cardigans too much as I know Royal Holloway also enjoys some snazzy knitwear, but we're also quite keen on corduroy and we'll happily roll with the librarian stereotypes to get a laugh. We're not afraid of posting photos of ourselves, again to show we're individuals rather than a corporation. And if a follower comes into the library, they may well be helped by that very person that they've seen on Twitter or Instagram. University can be quite an intimidating place when you first start, and I hope that our accounts make us more accessible. We produce help videos um, that can make it easier to navigate around a large building or to show how to issue and return books, which we can post and also direct users to our YouTube channel. Our lockdown, over lockdown, we definitely embraced our individuality. It was hard not to, as suddenly we were surrounded by all our own stuff rather than being in the same building at the same time. It changed what we could post. Finding content can be tricky at the best of times, especially in the summer when nothing much happens on campus. Lockdown certainly didn't help. It felt a real struggle at first as we no longer had the library and all it contained to fall back on. So on campus, you can always find an interesting book on the shelf, take a video of the book sorter, which continues to fascinate most people, take a photo of maybe our latest special collections exhibition, we couldn't do any of those things anymore, so we had to think of other interesting ways to hold our audience. So members of the team suggested different things that we could post, such as staff recommendations of things to watch, read and listen to. Early on, we had a series of museum at home tweets uh, while museums themselves were closed, showcasing weird and wonderful items we had in our own houses. We did a taskmaster style competition for welcome in September to keep things socially distanced as we'd normally hide golden tickets around the library and post clues on our channels for students. We obviously wanted to discourage wandering around the building. The tasks were recreate a book cover, uh, make your own book face image as inspired by us and show us the most Mancunian thing that you've seen so far. We also involved all staff by asking for photos of their colleagues during lockdown, i.e. their pets, uh, which were they're obviously more than happy to do. 
and more recently to mark a year since the pandemic and to show our appreciation to students for wearing their masks when in the library. Um, we asked for mask selfies and to rate their masks and give themselves a mark out of 10 for it. And of course, you saw our pass the chat hat video at the start to let users know that we were still available to talk to even when the library building was closed for so many months during the first lockdown and that you'd be talking to real people. And that's what we want our accounts to represent, the human touch. Luckily, we did also have some evergreen content to use on Instagram, such as photos of the library exterior or some book face images we hadn't used yet, which was so useful during lockdown. A bit of forethought goes a long way. We tend to gather books for a book face photo shoot so we can produce weeks worth of images and we'll ask the wider library team to take part and bring clothing that matches the book jackets. It takes a lot of organisation, but it is worth it when you know you have things to post week down the line. We're looking forward to building up our stash again when social distancing is no longer an issue and we're back on campus together. Now I've touched a little bit on Instagram, which is obviously much newer than our Twitter and Facebook accounts. It was used in a very ad hoc way to start with. We had a member of staff who was interested in photography, so we set up a library account. Early photos were of our book sorter, again, events and the library space as and when. When uh, we got some graduate trainees to come and work for us, um, a few of them started to help and the rotor became a bit more structured and there was more consistency and it was aimed more towards our demographic. So the split of our followers on Instagram is about 65% women and 35% men. The majority in the 18 to 24 or 25 to 34 age bracket. It shows that we're aiming our account at the right audience as ManMet's student base is a very similar split. We made more use of features such uh, on the app, how to videos, doing book face posts on Fridays, etc. At first we were using a mini iPad to do all of our photography and posts, but the library bought an iPhone for us so that we could take better quality images, which is obviously really important. Now we usually take our own phones as it's easier. Um, you can take a photo of something that catches your eye there and then, and we can post directly in the app as you can switch between profiles. We have the youngest social team members posting on Instagram, <coughs> except for maybe me, who have more of an interest in photography and playing around with stories and interactive elements. Our tone does shift from time to time as we've had a lot of team members come and go, whereas our Twitter team has a lot more MMU lifers on it. We try to keep posts informal and text short as it's essentially a visual medium. We take photos of people as well as buildings and stock, though we have a lot of camera shy colleagues, but we do try and not use the same people over and over again. So our followers don't think that there's only about four people working in the library. Maybe that's why I keep dyeing my hair so I can pretend I'm different people and keep the content fresh. The grid needs variation in the formats of posts too, so not too many of the same things following each other. So a mix of photos, graphics, videos and now reels too. There are always new features and types of posts being introduced to play around with and to make the most of. Engagement we find can be really hard on Instagram and it's still something that we're working on. Uh, but we find that we get lots more interaction with our followers on Insta in stories when we run polls on particular subjects or ask for suggestions via the question sticker. So, for example, we asked for LGBTQ plus book recommendations that we could compile into a wakelet list for LGBT plus history month. It create, co creates content for us, but it also makes our followers feel more involved. When there's actually something physical to press or to type, the app becomes a lot less passive. Stories are also vital when we have a very timely message. Algorithms work differently for every user, depending on how they use Instagram. So it may well be that some of our followers won't see one of our posts for a few days, but then by then it's too late and an event or announcement is no longer relevant. So with stories only lasting 24 hours, you know that people are viewing the information at the right time. And because they're only viewable for a short time, it also means you can be a lot more informal. If Insta posts are perhaps a little more slick most of the time, stories are more of a glimpse behind the scenes. They can be more fun. They can also back up a post with a bit more information. So as we don't want to be too wordy in an Instagram post, a story can go into that little bit more detail over several photos or videos. And also you can keep an eye on how many people drop off during a story too. So you can tweak how you post in future to capture your audience. And now we're starting to use students to record videos for us via content creators at the Students' Union. 
So it's not just librarians talking to students, they're getting information from their peers as shown here. This has been possible now that we have our comms officer in place, an actual marketing budget. It has so often been difficult to pursue these types of ideas previously when you also have a full time library role and you're balancing tasks. It's always been quite hard to get buy in from managers to start with, certainly for social media, as it was always seen as just another job to fit into your day. And it wasn't a medium that they necessarily used themselves, so they didn't really see the value in it. It could be tricky to find time to post when staff were heavily timetabled, but I think increasingly staff are now aware of how important social media channels can be. And it's a free method of promotion, which is can only be positive. As platforms have developed, it's also easier to schedule posts for those times that you might not be at your computer for the whole day. We used to use the scheduler Hootsuite a lot more for Twitter and Facebook, but now you can schedule via the native interface. We use it mostly for Instagram. It was a very exciting day when we discovered that you could schedule Instagram posts. It was a long time coming. It's still very limited. You can't add galleries or post stories, but it definitely takes the pressure off the team with so few of us posting. You can also use Facebook's Creator Studio to schedule for Instagram, but again, it's linked to my own personal Facebook account and I don't really fancy sharing my password. Using schedulers also means that you can post when you have that moment of inspiration, especially if maybe you only post once a week. You don't have to sit down on your day and go, right, I have to come up with something super entertaining right now. Or if time is of the essence, we'd share it with our social media mailing list so someone else on the team could post about it in their own style. That's not to say that we take our eye off the ball, though. And if someone has scheduled tweets for an afternoon, we'll usually ask another team member to just make sure that we're not missing any queries or comments. We do treat it as we would any inquiry desk. We want to answer questions as soon as we can. We also have a library blog, which is similarly tongue in cheek, and it gives advice about using the library, places to visit around Manchester, new resources we've bought, etc. Uh, but we can also address more serious issues such as mental health. It's managed by one of our Twitter team members and any staff members from the library can contribute, although there is a core team. We're able to promote articles via our social channels, so that's really great content for us. So if you get a chance, I really would have a look. It's worth it. I'm so proud of our social media channels. We've come a long way since starting out and I love that our team members enjoy posting and are so creative and that they all agreed to carry on posting during lockdown when the world felt so scary. We showcased our individual personalities and really embraced our surroundings. It gave reassurance to our staff and students that the library was still supporting our users with their studies, but that we could also put a smile on people's faces at such a precarious time. The fact that we've had such lovely comments and feedback shows us it's well worth our time and effort. And look, someone included a Paul Rudd gif. I have found my community. So thank you so much for listening. And if you would like to follow us, we're at MMU Library on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Natalie. That that was Fantastic. And I know while well, speaking for myself with the Royal Holloway account, your approach is different to ours. And as I said at the beginning, there's so many different ways of doing this. And I hope for the attendees, that's one of the things that comes out of it. And I'm in no way jealous of the poor Rudd gifts coming your way. That's <laughs> we've, we've occasionally used a Keanu Reeves at Royal Holloway, but poor Rudd's definitely some nice, wholesome content to lean into as well. And, and I think with the, I don't know if anyone else was paying attention to a few of the photos. I was paying spot Natalie in the photos and the different hairstyles and colours as well. Quite a which, lot. Um, always <laughs> impressive work. So thank you very much for that. For the attendees as well, if there's any kind of questions, comments and things like that, please do put them in the chat. We'll be picking them up in the question and answer uh, later on in the event. Um, however, I'm going to say thank you very much to Natalie again, and we'll move on to our next talk, which is Ned Potter from the uh, University of York Library. And his talk is going to be Rough Edges and Risks, Building Genuine Relationships Through Library Social Media. So over to you, Ned. Thank you very much. I think my camera is going to disappear um, when I share my screen. So apologies for that, but hello, everyone. Um, right. So um, 
Thank you very much to Greg and everybody at Royal Holloway for organizing this and inviting us. It feels like a long time since we've had a library event on social media because there was obviously a massive amount of them in the early years. And then it feels like they just kind of went away because other stuff became very exciting. Um, and it's still really important. So it's quite nice that we're getting together to talk about this. Um, and it's, it's a great honor to be on the bill with some really excellent uh, libraries. So I wanted to talk about um, building relationships. I think one of the most important things you can do with social media is think about why you're there and what you're trying to achieve. So for us at the University of York, we do want to influence behavior. We don't just want people to like the library in all senses of that word. We want them to behave differently as a result of it. We want them to you know, come into the building more when that's appropriate. We want them to use the resources that we paid all the money for. We want them to talk about the library in positive ways. But it's not just for us. We, we want to do stuff for them as well. We want to be able to help them more. We want them to feel comfortable and not intimidated. We want to build relationships. Um, so for that to work, we found that actually taking some risks has helped build those relationships. And then we get more questions, more engagement and a more kind of meaningful time from it. So we have um, four main platforms here. We have a, a blog, but it, it gets so seldom used, I'm not really including it here. So um, we have twi Twitter, which we think of as really as, as the mouthpiece of the library. We do lots of uh, stuff on Twitter, we, lots of announcements. If we have something to say, we will say it there. Now, there are undergraduates on Twitter. It's not as simple as saying there aren't any there. Um, they don't tend to be very vocal about being on Twitter, but there are undergraduates there. However, most of the feedback and comments and, and interaction we get are from postgrads and from academics. By contrast, I would say that, you know, if you look at the demographic details, there's absolutely no doubt that the vast majority, I mean, really 96%, I would say, of our, of our undergrads are on Instagram. So it's really, really important. And we're trying to put more stock into it uh, as, as time goes on. But it's very time consuming. As Natalie said, there's so many different things you can do with it. Um, and then there is YouTube, and, and we found YouTube to be hugely beneficial, particularly since the pandemic started. I think this seems to be fairly universal across libraries that um, there is a much greater interest in video communication. And it, it makes sense, you know, it's, there's more of a personal connection with video when you're literally locked in a, in a room or in a house over a lockdown period. And then, of course, there is Facebook. Uh, Facebook is where hope uh, and happiness goes to die. Um, and I don't know why we're still on there because it's an absolute waste of time and it's a terrible platform and it's one of the worst things about the world. But we still got it. Um, probably for at least another couple of years, it will limp on before I finally had the guts to kill it. Um, so here's a little timeline of what we did. Uh, Facebook and Twitter were set up by my colleague, Tony Wilson, before I even got to York uh, in 2010. Just kill it. I agree, Jenny. I, I, the thing is, we still get some value from reinforcing key messages on it. So that's why we still have it, but we don't put time into it. What we don't do is let it take our time. Um, so yeah, we've had, we've had Facebook and Twitter for a very long time. And then in 2012, I set up a YouTube account. Um, it took a while to get this okay, but then we got an Instagram account in 2016. The weird thing about this timeline is for a lot of it, we weren't fully in control of the social media because there was a central comms team, but we got the control back in 2019. And then in 2020, when we went to lockdown, we really changed how we approach things. So up until that point, um, I had been, you know, I wrote guidance and policies and stuff and chaired the marketing group, but I wasn't uh, really doing a lot of the stuff because I was looking after three departments as an academic liaison librarian. So for the first um, time when the pandemic hit, we made time available for comms for me in a formalized way, which hadn't happened before. So I lost two departments to focus on communication because communication was so important in the pandemic when it was all, um, you know, uh, going weird. Uh, so um, freeing up the time really made a huge difference to our comms. Um, so, so net what program are your presentation? That if that's Ned, what program is the presentation? It's just, it's just this is just a, a PowerPoint. Um, so this is a comparison between Twitter uh, before and since the pandemic hit. So you can see the the, the blue lines uh, are the are the previous fifteen months, and the yellow lines are. Uh, the current 15 months. And to put it in percentage terms, you can see that the retweets, the link clicks, the likes, the replies, they've all gone up massively. This is a slightly weird graph because I've plotted it all on the same 
numbers. And in fact, the number of likes, and number of replies are never going to be that similar. So it looks like replies isn't that much, but actually that's the one I'm most proud of. Our replies have gone up 349%. And that is just unbelievably huge for, for an account this old. You know, we're, we're 10 years old. It's, we're not like a new account. And, and that's because we put a huge amount of time into engaging our users there and making them, you know, um, believe that we want to engage with them. So so there's been a huge change because we put the time into it. Um, YouTube, pre-pandemic, this is just percentage increase. So the 15 months since the pandemic has been going on, the views have gone up 110% or something like that. The watch time's up 280%. Although that's partly because of um, one particular video, which has a, a lot of time. So why the numbers up? Obviously, people are online more, right? So we can't just claim the credit for this through our, like our brilliant social media. People are online in social media more than they were before because what else is there to do? And then there's the fact, there's the stuff that I'm talking about today. There's the prioritization of social media and communication. We put time into it. We've tried really hard. And also, I, ha I have to flag up, I, the, the services that we're talking about on social media are really good. I am um, genuinely like proud of University of York Library, particularly over the last couple of years, where what we've been doing has been amazing. So, you know, whilst I'm like delighted with the social media and, and the team of people doing stuff, our job is really, really easy because what we're talking about is good. <laughs> like people like the library. So we have a head start there. Um, so I don't want to just, you know, claim that the numbers are just as a result of our amazing skills. There are other factors like the fact that people are more online and the fact that what we're talking about is already popular and that helps a lot. Um, so what I want to talk about today is the kind of core principles of how we approach stuff, a few logistical things, um, and then some examples of hits and misses. Um, so the, the the voice and the approach, the principles that underline everything that we that we do um, so far. So the first thing is we are informal and we're friendly and we're human, and that is the, the most important thing of all the things. Um, so. Uh, if, sorry, the, someone who is unmuted, if you're able to mute yourself, that would be brilliant because it's it's coming out of the speakers and into the microphone. I'm worried about a kind of feedback loop. Um, so uh, what we want to do is basically speak like a human being and we will, you know, we'll capitalize stuff, we'll use, we'll use punctuation, but otherwise we will be as informal as we can. We don't want any kind of thing where we're trying to be formal to be credible. We don't believe in that. So we try and speak like a human being. So, you know, we're sort of saying things like, sorry, it's taken a while to get this far, but here's what we're doing. Um, and then we're saying, here's a tricky thing to say, please consider not coming to the library if that's if that's possible for you. And please be nice to us because even though we know tensions are high, our staff on the ground are putting themselves at risk by being there. We're just, we're just trying to be friendly and human and just communicate in a, in a real way. Um, and this has gone down really, really well. We get a huge amount of positive feedback for the uh, the, the the tone that we've adopted. Um, we are here because we want to engage. We're not we're not faking it. Um, we, we want to engage. We want to hear from the students. We want to talk to the academics. Um, we want to. Uh, we don't want to be like cool. We don't want to be hello fellow students. But we don't want to be formal and, and austere and have a distance between us either. We just want to be there to to have genuine in, in, engagement. Um, so, uh, you know, we will say, I'm really sorry this happened. We won't try and sort of minimize if people complain, we'll say, that sounds awful, that's annoying. Or we will, if someone says something great, we will respond with massive enthusiasm. Thank you, Mabina, for posting the GIF that I just referenced there. And we're inclusive. Um, so uh, there's an obvious way in which we can be inclusive, which is to do with accessibility. We are, obviously, we're using alt text. Um, on Twitter, you can't have alt text or video, so we will describe the video and we get nice feedback for that. But it's not just that. We try to avoid, you know, um, just posting pictures of uh, um, middle-aged white men with young girlfriends, which is what stock photography seems to consist of in its entirety. Um, none of those who are posting at the moment are black, so we don't use black reaction GIFs because that feels like, sort of, you know, the, people talk about digital blackface. So we're kind of careful about how we, how we use that. But we do include you know, all kinds of people in our in our pictures and our images and, uh, you know, people with disabilities as well. You know, just we try to be inclusive. We try to to make sure that we're representing a wide range of, of, of students as we as we talk to them. 
we communicate early, we're open, we, we, we don't hide anything if, unless there's a massively, really, really good reason to, to not be completely open, we will be as open as we can. And sometimes that just means saying nothing, but saying that we can't say anything because we don't know what to say. So, um, you know, it's just saying, right, we're working on new government guidance, Cheers, government, for letting us know with three minutes notice what we had to do. Bear with us. And then, again, you know, we've, people are, are, are very positive about that. We've had a lot of positive feedback from our own student unions and stuff about how we will always try and say something, even if we don't yet have a full thing to say. Um, this is really important. Anyone who follows me on Twitter will have heard me banging on about this before. Our users are the cake. So if, if another library likes what we do, or if something goes semi-viral and members of the public like it, that's absolutely fine. But that is not something that we actually aim for. That's just the icing on the cake. Everything that we do is aimed at our users. And uh, if we are doing something that gets a lot of uh, good comments from libraries and no comments from our users, that is a sign to us that what we're doing isn't working very well. If you lot like it a lot, then and our students don't, then it isn't successful. So um, we, we, we should be aiming everything at the users and it's really tempting to just have nice conversations with nice libraries, but that can only be a sideline or else you're gonna sort of drift away from the kind of core mission of why you're there. Um, we do use the platforms together, but we don't use them the same. We don't auto Facebook and tweet the same information, for example. We will package stuff up properly for the platform. But that said, it is useful to use them together to reinforce key messages. So things like using the banner pictures to uh, say the same thing at a key time is a, is a really nice thing that we do. So there is some uh, cross-pollination there, but we're not using them in an identical way. Fundamentally, we're not trying to please everyone. We're not, we don't try to displease anyone. Um, but, but basically, if you're going to make any impression, you, you can't just please everyone because then no one is that interested in what you're doing. So it's not that we're going to ever try to offend anyone or anything like that. It's just that there are some people whom we just don't count amongst the high priority. So, so for example, this, this chap, um, I tweeted at the time, this is, must, must be what it is like to be female and online. Like you do something really successful and then some guy slides into your mentions and says, uh, guys, I think you should have done it like I would have done it. I mean, this is from a thread that was unbelievably successful. We had a huge amount of engagement from our own students. And then he's like, uh, you shouldn't have started with the thing about consultation because most people have switched off and they didn't switch off. But the thing about this was, the consultation bit was aimed at our students and the thread was aimed at our students. We weren't aiming at David Hudson or indeed anyone except our students and our staff. So I replied with the just the laughing emoji, but what I wanted to say was, you not liking it is of literally no consequence to us um, because it doesn't matter because we're not trying to please everyone. We're trying to get information to people who, who need it. Now, I wanna, I wanna ask you a question in the chat. I'm gonna shut up for 30 seconds to give you a chance to type. How important do you think consistency is to library social media? And this is a genuine question. My, my, I'll, I'll tell you my feelings about it in a second, but I'm interested in different approaches to it because I think sometimes, like I do social media workshops sometimes and people sort of say, uh, I really worry about consistency. I worry that there's two different people tweeting and they have completely different voices and stuff. So I'm interested to know in the chat what what, what your approach is. Um, so let me just, you know, stop talking for 10 seconds, give you a chance to type. How important is consistency to library social media? Okay, so I like that. Um, the voice has to sound like a personality is the key thing. Uh, yeah, so consistency without stagnation, I think that's a good point as well. Uh, sometimes messing things up can be an unnoticed, uncovering unnoticed themes. I like that a lot. Yeah, different approaches reach different audiences. That's really important as well. Some consistency is good, but there are a few voices that changes over time. That's not a bad thing. And that is going to happen. Yeah, so Sarah has summed up uh, exactly what I think about it, really. I, I do think consistency can be good, but it's also nice to have a bit of diversity in, in the voices. Um, yeah, regularity is more important than consistency. That's a nice way of looking at it. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So I think uh, being kind of regularly friendly and helpful is more important than having the same voice, I guess. So yeah, I can see what Joe means. There's a case for both. Um, yeah, consistency in terms of actually posting is more important than consistency of voice. This, that other Joe this time, I would totally agree with that as well. Yeah, don't need, doesn't need to be consistent uniform. Okay, so I think there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a, a, a theme running through here, which is great because I think people worry that we should be really consistent and find it hard to achieve. And I don't want people to worry. And I think it doesn't need to be achieved. Um, so yeah, variation is a good thing in under, with underlying tone, I think is a great way of looking at it. Okay, you're totally on board with this. This is, this is really good. So 
basically what I'm saying is consistency is it's overrated. So it's not that it's not important. It's not that it's not desirable, but it's better to have you know, more than one personality speaking than, than, than getting rid of all the rough edges. But, but the most important thing I want to say is if the consistency prevents risk taking, then it becomes a problem. So, you know, one of the things that I like about our account is there are there are people who work on it with me who do things that I would never do. Like I'm just not interested in doing. And that is a risk because there's inconsistency because I do a lot of the tweeting. But it's, it's a great thing because you get more than one voice. You, people get to have different sides of the account and people respond to different things. So the stuff that I like isn't the only good stuff. So I, I think it's it's something that we shouldn't worry too much about. But I like the way that people have put it in the chat. I think there's, there's some really good lessons there. Um, final principle, if in doubt, say it like you would out loud. Um, so, you know, if there's ever a tense thing, a, a tricky conversation, a complaint, a, a, a contentious issue, just imagine that you're sat there with the person in front of you, maybe at the reference desk or whatever. Um, yeah, so uh, exactly. We worried that people worrying too much about consistency and this slowed down. So what you don't want to do is just have kind of a inaction because you're worrying about consistency. That's another good reason to be inconsistent. So yeah, if you're wondering how to say it, how would you say it if the user was sat in front of you? Just say it like that. That's the best way to do it. Okay. Just briefly, I wanted to talk about the logistics of, of how we do it and the tools that we use. So there is a library comms group. And the thing is, there used to be a wider library marketing group, but when the pandemic hit, we, we really boiled it down to just some essential people that could just talk about comms and do it. So in this group, there are three of us who do a lot of the social media. So uh, my colleagues, Rebecca and Megan, uh, and I do a lot of the posting. Um, and a massive shout out to Alice Bennett, who used to do a lot of the posting. And I was very sad when her job changed and she uh, was unable to, to do it. But she's still in the group as a kind of uh, link to the IT department, which is really good. There's a couple more people who are very much involved in the planning stage. So we do more than just social media. I'm just not talking about that other stuff today. And there is also the customer services manager and the deputy director are on the group just really to feed stuff into us and sometimes we need to sense check stuff but most often we don't um you know uh, so we don't sort of seek permission to say a certain thing i think we're all roughly on the same page about what we want to tweet about so they're just there to kind of sort of say right so if i say on social media that we're going 24 hours opening from july is that definitely true or do i need to not say it uh, and that's really useful we don't have meetings, um, but we do have Slack, uh, all the all just constant communication on Slack uh, rather than meetings and emails. There is a, a rolling calendar that we use in Padlet to uh, um, basically keep track of what's coming up and that kind of thing. Um, and then there is written guidance uh, on using Instagram um, and Twitter and Facebook. So everyone has a chance to, to work out what we're doing before they actually have to do it. There's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer support. So what we're trying to do is empower people to feel like they know what they're doing rather than control the way that they do it. Um, so everyone can always ask, what do you think of this? Um, and then there are no targets, there's no quotas. We don't have to tweet or Instagram a certain amount of times in a week. Um, that always backfires. There's no rotor, but if I'm off, I will always say, by the way, I'm off on Thursday, so if people can keep an extra eye on social media, that'd be great. Um, and then we have, you know, I, I'll compile analytics and reports annually to track the progress. Within the tools themselves, we used a lot of, you know, useful things that we found. It's really worth exploring what the tool has to offer. So pinned tweets and threads are very important. Um, tagging useful account and images, all the accessibility stuff, using GIFs that have already been discussed in the in the chat a bit, stories and reels and IGTV in in Instagram, proper playlists uh, and you know thumbnail links to other videos in YouTube, making sure that your featured video on your channel is the one that you want people to see, you know, properly curating your social media channels. It all helps. So for the last bit, I just wanted to talk about some some hits and misses. Um, on, a, on a general scale, uh, the hits and misses, I mean, our Twitter account is really, I'm 100% I'm happy with it. Uh, it works really, really well. The, the danger is that we over-prioritize because it works so well. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of our uh, messaging is extremely successfully reaching postgrads and academics, but we need to spend more time on Instagram to make sure that we're reaching uh, undergraduates. The Instagram account is more recent. We haven't had control for of it, uh, you know, for as long as many years. Um, so we're putting a real push into it now. My re colleague Rebecca is being massively helpful with that as we try and basically 
up the audience for our key messages of undergraduates on, on that channel. YouTube is great, but it, you know, even if you're really quick at making videos, they take some time and, and occasionally what you get back for that time it seems like, is was that really, do we really get enough back? Um, our Facebook account uh, doesn't really work and it's awful. Um, so uh, I think that ebook um, thread that I mentioned that the guy um, commented on, that was the most successful thing we've ever done on social media. More than a quarter of a million people saw it. We tried to recreate it on Facebook and we got a single like. <laughs> um, so that really sums up Facebook for us. I, I, I'm not saying Facebook can't be used well. Uh, and certainly in public libraries, I think it's got a massive role. But for academic libraries, we have properly done some strategic experimentation with what works and what doesn't. And even the stuff that works well, doesn't work well enough to put a lot of time into, I would say. Here's, here's a miss. We don't have TikTok. I can't see a way to use TikTok successfully without appearing on camera, and I'm not prepared to appear on camera, and I don't want to ask anybody else to either. So there is a looming issue there, which is that we will all have TikTok in a couple of years. We won't be able to not have it, but I don't know what to do with it. Um, so Judith said, you mentioned blogs doesn't get engagement, thinking of moving uh, to our YouTube channel. Would you say this would be a worthwhile venture? I would, I would, yeah. Um, I think you can use aspects of Instagram stories as well. You can post longer stuff on Twitter and threads. I think blogs, uh, you know, they, if they're a useful way to get information out to people, then that's absolutely fine. But I don't think they're a big way to find people anymore. I think even if you use a blog, you're going to have to promote it on the other channels anyway to get people to know that it's there. So um, some successful stuff, um, whimsy we found works well. Now this, I've, I've talked about this tweet in workshops before, the, the end of March tweet. This is exactly the kind of thing I wouldn't have done prior to the pandemic. It's exactly the kind of thing where I would worry that someone wouldn't get it or that people would, someone would reply, that's just a picture of the library in the 60s. That's not the start of March. And, and just the, the, the doubt that that might cause, I wouldn't have done it. And the, the response was so good that that gave me permission to do more whimsical stuff and like the ridiculous nature is healing thing that you can see on the right there. So um, I felt like that gave us permission to be non-serious in very serious times. As a uh, sort of example of, a, of an unsuccessful thing, we did this video about our catalog. Um, lots of people were asking us to buy books that we already owned because they hadn't looked it up in your search. So I made what I thought was a pretty good uh, <laughs> video about your search, but it's got 400 views. Now, 400 views isn't bad in itself, but the thing is we promoted this really hard. It's There's a banner on your search still, which is normally a great way to drive traffic because your search is so busy. Um, we put it on IGTV and it got 90 views. Um, so because we promoted it so hard, 400 views is not successful. And that's because it doesn't have a shareable hook. Um, it doesn't have an, an easy way to get people in and you've got to have a shareable hook. So that just fundamentally was not a success. Um, threads have worked really well. So this is the ebook thread that I mentioned before with the with the 280,000 impressions. Um, and we just absolutely went for it and, and told everybody everything about it and was just completely open. And I was really surprised that it went as well as it did. And we got loads of, of really, really lovely feedback. And there was some feedback that was from the industry, which is always nice. But more importantly, there was also feedback from our own students and staff. And a lot of our own students just replying like, oh my God, I had no idea. So uh, just telling people stuff. And, and again, this is my colleague, Alice. She said, I was talking to a student. He said, why can't you get the eBooks? I explained, the student said, you should tell people this. Alice said to me, we should tell people this. So we told people this and it worked really well. Um, this is an example of some pop culture stuff. Uh, we did this, you wouldn't steal, sorry, there's a really loud plane going over my house. Um, you wouldn't steal the study space. If, you, if you're old enough to remember the DVDs, um, copyright notice that we all had to sit through because you couldn't fast forward it. We did a version of that where I found the music and then I found the font and then I did some stock footage stuff to make it. So I'm gonna try and play it now. Let's see if this works. So there you go. That was really popular on Twitter. Um, 
you know, lots of people saw it. You can see at the time I took that screenshot, 4,000 views, which is more than we'd normally get for a YouTube video by a long way, um, and nice feedback. However, the the postgrads, they were already kind of okay with the with the etiquette stuff. It's the undergrads that we really needed to reach. None of the undergrads would be old enough to remember that reference, so we couldn't really translate it to Instagram. So although it was a success in and of itself, it didn't quite hit the aim that we had, which was to massively improve study space etiquette. Sometimes we do stuff like this pop culture reference and no one responds at all. Uh, two likes for that amazing joke about um, Fight Club. So sometimes, you know, it just falls on, on deaf ears a little bit. Um, yeah, it's true that the, uh, the that intro used to be really loud <laughs> on the TVTs. Um, niche content we found works well. Uh, so this is our library home from home study with me video. It's just two hours of me uh, having an existential crisis about what I was doing. If you, so that's me making notes that you can see in the reflection of the glass there. If you were to look at my notebook from that day, you would probably have me uh, arrested. It says things like, oh God, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just writing for the sake of writing something. Why am I here? What is this? And that kind of thing. I, it seems like the, the scribblings of someone who's right on the edge, but it went down really well. Um, 698 hours of watch time is ludicrous for us by our standards. Um, people think it's really thoughtful. Uh, people, I love that comment. It's real, worked really well for me. I put it on and focused solidly for hours for the first time in ages. I mean, that's just the best possible result. Um, this person absolutely loves it. Um, I really like the comment in the middle on the right. I'm sat in a library using the sounds of the library to block, block out the sounds of a library. So people uh, just were listening to it whilst they could have heard a real library. That blows my mind. Also on the niche content uh, front, we did this thing about um, the government retraining survey that you might remember, and I didn't expect anyone to respond to it at all, and it went down really, really well. Um, so uh, sometimes the niche stuff is the best. Um, getting to the end now, uh, SAS, this is a very famous tweet from my colleague Alice about bras being handed in, um, doing a, a, a little decision tree about vaping in study rooms. It's just they're both examples of the first idea you have, which is, oh, there's a bra handed in lost property or someone set an alarm off is not necessarily the best idea to go with. If you can find a way to frame it, then that's interesting. I wanted to give a, a big example of a failure. So we did a whole long, big messaging campaign using the famous York Duck long boy. Um, so you can see uh, there's an example here where basically what I'm trying to do is make people think it's rude, but it isn't. Um, and it was very, very popular. People really like this a lot. We also used a famous cat that comes into the library all the time. We put face masks on them in pictures. However, our staff who were actually working in the library expressed worries about this. They didn't think it was, uh, it, they felt it was too irreverent, which was a choice that we'd made for good reason because people just weren't listening to the face covering stuff anymore. But people were uncomfortable with it, so we canned it. We got rid of it. We didn't do the rest of the stuff we were gonna do because I don't think it's right as somebody who wasn't working on campus to just sort of dismiss the thoughts of the people who were. Wholesomeness always goes down well. Uh, the Robins in the library was ridiculously popular. Um, we do a welcome every year that we stole from the British Library. And I love this comment. Oh, my days. I just love this. And I love York. Never let me leave. It's just such a lovely thing for someone to say. Um, OK, so that's it, basically. I've cherry picked examples of things that worked and, and some things that didn't. Ultimately, you know, if you look at our account, there's just stuff that doesn't work. There's some stuff that does, and that's okay because we're not trying to be perfect. We're not trying to be nailing it. We cannot be like Orkney who just are just unbelievably successful with everything they do. We're not trying to get a uniformity of tone. And as people suggested in the chat, what we're trying to get the uniformity of is just friendliness and helpfulness and, and empathy. And I think fundamentally what we've really learned from this pandemic is putting time and, and senior staff time into communication is 100% worth it. And it, you know, social media should never be something that's just tacked on. It's so important. Having your social media joined up with the other communication you're doing is so important. Um, so going forward in more hopefully normal times, I think we're still gonna have resource put into this so that basically so that I have time to properly prioritize this rather than trying to fit it around a gazillion other things because it's been worth it. So um, if you've got questions or comments, um, I'm at the end of my time now. And the last thing I want to do is, is delay people's break because we all need a little bit of coffee. Um, so I'm happy to answer them in the, in the panel discussion uh, 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 later on. And thank you for all the, the comments and 
uh, questions and stuff in the chat as we went through. I'm sorry I couldn't pick more of them up, but I just don't want to go over time. Um, if you do want to uh, follow us on uh, Twitter, then UOI Library is the name of the library, and same on Instagram. I mean, you could find Facebook if you wanted, but I'd honestly rather you didn't because it's such a dumpster fire of an account. Um, and uh, I've just tweeted these slides, so should you ever wish to look at them again, um, then the option is there. Okay, I'm going to stop. Uh, I'll hand back to Greg and looking forward to the rest of the presentations. I was going to say, Ned, please tell us what you really think of Facebook, but um, I think you've made it quite clear. But um, no, I'm going to say thank you very much, Ned. There's some great comments that have come through in the chat as well. I know there's some kind of general questions which we'll pick up when we get to the uh, panel question and answer as well. Just before we do go to the break as well, I just want to remind people if you are tweeting about the event, please use the hashtag LibSocMed if you want to. You're not obliged to, but it does mean people can track the conversation that is happening as the event's going on. I can see there's been some really interesting conversation about TikTok as well. And I think maybe when we're on the break, if people do want to share some maybe ideas or experiences they've had with TikTok, because for myself and at Royal Holloway, we've not had any real experience using TikTok. I think to borrow the phrase Ned used, we're a bit worried about being kind of what's up fellow kids on the platform. We're not quite sure how to use it properly for our own advantage yet. Hello everybody and hopefully welcome back from the break. I hope you're suitably refreshed that you've got cups of tea, coffee, hot chocolate, whatever your preference is. And hopefully most of you have had some biscuits left over in the cupboards as well that you've been able to get to. I think a couple of people in the chat said they were uh, bereft of biscuits, which is in no way distressing at all. But anyways, going into our next talk then is my colleague Patrick Walker and myself talking about cardigans, kickstalls and geese how we're building a digital community at Royal Holloway Library. Hi everyone. Um, so to start with, um, we asked ourselves, what are our main aims and objectives with our social media? Um, and the overall aim of our account is twofold, really. Um, obviously, being an academic library, we want to promote the library's collections and signpost users to our services. But also more than that, we really just want to make people think and feel positively about the library and libraries in general. And basically, when they think about libraries, we want to give them warm and fuzzy feelings. I suppose a bit like wearing your favourite cardigan then. Exactly, exactly. And um, our chief method of doing this has been to try and create what we've termed a digital community through social media. Um, and by this, we mean an online community where people feel welcome, safe, and have an opportunity to contribute and be a part of it. Um, there's also the question of who is the target audience of our social media, which I think Ned touched a bit on in the last talk. Um, on a basic level, of course, our target audience is student and staff members at Royal Holloway. Um, beyond that, we're aware we have a, a good alumni following, um, as well as people from other libraries and information professionals. And we're also mindful that we do get prospective students following us as uh, our account as well. Um, ultimately, however, Twitter is by its nature an open public forum, which means that anyone can follow us. So given this, we can't narrow down our target audience to a specific demographic, really. It's just anyone and everyone that wants to follow us. Um, a good example of this, as Ned mentioned again, is Orkney Library. Um, their Twitter has 70,000 followers, which is just mad uh, by our standards. Uh, and that's actually three times the actual population of Orkney itself. So part of our thinking really is that we'd like our account to be successful in its own right um, on social media. And that inevitably entails reaching people outside of, of uh, Royal Holloway and Library Twitter. Taking all of that into account, then that obviously we've we've got a target audience, but we're mindful that really anyone can be following it. One of the questions we kind of asked ourselves when we were thinking about the account is how do we want to be perceived? What is it we want people to think of or how would they describe us? And that's actually a question we're going to come back to at the end of the talk. But really, when we were thinking about this question, the one word that we kept coming back to really was wholesome. We wanted just people to think that we were a wholesome account. And so by this, we meant positive, optimistic. Um, I'm going to say funny and you can pretend I'm doing the air quotes around it because funny is very kind of subjective. But when we write our content, then the kind of question we're asking ourselves is, is this wholesome? Is this a positive message? Is this something that's going to be hopefully uplifting for the person reading it? 
Yeah, and the way we use humour and our brand of humour kind of naturally follows off that. Um, so I think our style of humour would generously be described as deliberately bad dad jokes um, and puns. Uh, so basically everyone groans. Um, in fact, people often will literally reply to some of our tweets with the word groan. Um, and our thinking behind that is that a collective groan unites people more than us trying to be funny and failing and it potentially being divisive. Um, an important thing as well is our humour is never at someone's expense, except sometimes our own, um, usually by sort of ironically riffing off uh, kind of established and well-worn stereotypes of librarians. Um, we do make occasional use of mimetic humour as well, and we'll show you some examples of what we mean by that later. Um, but we generally try to avoid jumping on trends unless there's a good specific library link um, at the risk of being seen as, you know, sort of very what's up fellow kids. So kind of taking all this to the account there, into account, then, so how would we actually describe the personality of our social media account? And going back 18 months, two years, we actually kind of sat down and wrote a strategy document that in kind of loose terms tried to define what this actually was. And there's, I don't want to say rules, but some kind of guidelines that we then set out that we used as the basis for the personality of our account. In that sense, and this is where you, you were kind of picking up, there's the different ways to approach this, because as um, Natalie was saying with MMU, they write in I. We actually use, if I say the royal we, and so like the collective sense is in, we're not writing as an individual, we're writing in our heads as if we are actually the library and it's the library that has a personality. Our thinking behind that is that we don't want people necessarily to feel an affinity with a particular individual that's running the account. We want them to have it with the library and the service and the account as a whole, rather than it being specific to one person. And also the hope as well that with the personality, it's something that we can have a bit of longevity that isn't tied to one person. And so it's got a continuity there as well. And in terms of the personality as well, like the truth of it is that it's rooted in the people who are actually writing the account, but it's kind of cherry picking out particular parts of those personalities that we think work best with how we wanted the account to be perceived. I think if me and Patrick were allowed to be a bit more indulgent, the humour might be a bit more um, dark at times, perhaps. But as we said, we want it to be positive and wholesome. And so that's where the kind of tone comes from as well. Like we've used the word wholesome, but I'd also say we want to be authentic then, we want to be honest and we want to be informative. In terms of the personality as well, like, um, yes, we, we sometimes lean into certain perceptions or stereotypes of librarians, but we're hoping we're doing that as a contrast against what the rest of our content showing that, OK, we might mention cardigans, but we're not all about cardigans. I don't know about how many people are wearing particularly splendiferous knitwear today, but that's not something that's true of librarians from my experience. But it's a perception that we lean into and try and then subvert and play off. What are the other things we do as well in terms of the accounts personalities? We have a pride in our college, the library and the history behind it as well. And some of the stories that we tell about the college's history kind of ties into this digital community building, this sense of belonging as well. In terms of this, like it's all about creating this kind of perception then that it's the library that's tweeting, it's positive, it's wholesome messaging, it's trying to reach, yes, our target audience, but a bit wider beyond that as well, that we're not just talking about our library, but libraries. And we want to show really that we're not just shushing and shelving. Yeah, and one of the ways that we build um, build on that kind of personality of the account and express it is through um, recurring content and themes, um, which we'll look at in a bit more depth later on. But the main idea here is that we have certain repeating jokes and references that people who have who have followed the account for a while will recognise and buy into. It's sort of like an ongoing story that is drip fed over time. Um, for new followers as well, it hopefully creates the idea that they've stumbled onto an active community, uh, one that they want to be a part of themselves. So as you can see, Greg's um, brought up some examples here to show you what we mean. Um, so yeah, so we picked out some of the kind of one-off joke tweets that we've done in the past to illustrate um, the style of humour of the account. Um, as we said, our, our humour is best described as deliberately bad puns and 
dad jokes and cracker jokes and we promise it is deliberately bad we're not just that painfully unfunny um, so if you look at the top left there you can see we a uh, joke we did about charles dickens and um, which did pretty well um, it's self-aware and it mostly just elicits, elicits sighs and eye rolls, which we take as a compliment. Um, but it also kind of plays off the well-worn stereotype of librarians as, you know, a little bit uncool, um, especially as we know that those stereotypes usually aren't true. Um, but sometimes we also like to kind of um, subvert and undermine those perceived stereotypes um, by being sarcastic, sassy, or even just a bit weird and abstract, um, like you can see with the tweet there, claiming our account is actually run by three small children in a trench coat. Um, I'm aware that sounds even more ridiculous read out loud. Um, obviously, part of this is us just being weird to make ourselves laugh, but we also think it does serve a purpose for our social media by balancing out some of the kind of drier informational posts, for want of a better word, and also breaking from the usual tone that people might expect of a library account. And again, it, you know, it helps undermine those kind of cliches of, of libraries and librarians. Um, as we said, our humour also occasionally leans into more sort of derivative mimetic content, um, by which we mean kind of referencing humor, humorous images and trends that are spreading through social media. Um, so you can see there in the top left, Twitter aficionados will remember the meme that did the rounds earlier this year of Bernie Sanders sat outside in his gorgeous knitted mittens truly very jealous of them um, and we followed this trend along with a lot of other people but uh, in a way that we felt was still unique to the library uh, and this is our litmus test really for sharing memetic content when we do we sort of ask ourselves does it match the tone and personality of the account is it wholesome is it humorous and can we work it in a way that's somehow unique to us even if as in this example it's li literally just a, a nice mocked up selfie of Bernie Sanders in front of the library building um, to sort of appeal to uh, users that might not have been on campus for several months at that time. Um, and it's for that reason as well that we tend to avoid sharing generic content. Um, for example, Greg uh, will say he insists on an absolutely ironclad rule that we never, ever, ever use generic GIFs ever on pain of excommunication. Uh, it's quite frightening. Um, <laughs> Uh, but mainly we just want to avoid jumping on a, on the bandwagon for the sake of it. So uh, a question many of you will rightfully ask is what is the point in doing all of this? Um, well, as you can see, Greg's brought up the analytics for the Bernie Sanders tweet there. So you can see off of 36,000 impressions and three and a half thousand engagements for this tweet, um, we got 88 clicks due to our profile and 239 likes. So you can see that this sort of meme humour uh, serves a purpose in that it's a good way of generating traffic to our account and bringing attention to our, our services and our resources. But it also develops the personality of the account as well and makes it more discoverable, discoverable sorry, to people who might not have been aware of it beforehand. Alongside the kind of one off jokes and humour that we do, then there's actually a number of reoccurring themes, content jokes or things that we reference back to that we do on the account over a period of time. And by a period of time, some of the ones that I'm going to share as examples here have been going for nearly 18 months, maybe, maybe even close to two years, some of them in that respect. And the reason that we do this is well, wh why do we want reoccurring jokes or things? There's a couple of layers to this. The first thing is, is we like the idea that there's some sort of payoff for people who've been following the account for a period of time, that they may have been aware of tweets that we've done in the past referencing certain jokes or events. And so when it comes back around again, there's the feeling, oh, it's an event that's growing. It's something that's continuing. It's a community that I'm part of and they're commenting on it and can be involved in it. But for someone who's discovering it new as well, like as Patrick said, it's like they're coming across an active community, they're discovering it, and it's something hopefully that they might be drawn into and want to be involved in. The fact that the content is specific to us for the most part, it's about Royal Holloway, it's about our library or libraries. It's the idea then that people, especially our students, our staff and colleagues, are then buying into it as well, that they're part of it. And it's this whole idea that we're building these narratives, these ongoing stories that people can then be interested in and involved with. 
and especially with some of the kind of topics on this, like the slide I've got at the moment's got some information about geese on it. It might not always be immediately something you'd associate with why is the library talking about it, but quite often with how we do the content, it folds in to a number of things we're trying to promote or um, talk about as well. And kind of one of the lessons we've learned from this, as well as we've gone with this reoccurring themes and content is finding this balance between not doing it too often so that the novelty wears off, but doing it often enough so that people kind of stay clued into the joke, they're still aware of it, and it's not like, hold on, what's going on here? Now, the example that I've got up here about the geese, and there's a few more examples on my next slide as well, you might be saying, well, why geese? Where's geese come from in this respect? What's the whole idea of that? And actually, I'll tell a little bit of the backstory here and with slight apologies to Ned and Longboy up at York as well, that a lot of this actual whole thing about the geese was born out of jealousy. You may have been aware of a Twitter account called Banshire University, who during lockdown ran who, which campus has got the best geese. Um, Longboy, obviously, I think Longboy did win it. But one of the things at Royal Hollow is we don't have any geese. There was this nice, fun Twitter event happening that we didn't get to be part of. And so there was the dual thing that said, well, actually, we don't have geese because they're banned in the library out of a kind of bit of a pithy response from us in that response. But also there is a meme online as well of a no geese allowed sign next to a lake. And we just tweeted the picture of the library, no geese allowed with a kind of reference to some sort of uh, event that had happened. No event had actually happened, or maybe this is just a convenient cover story to cover it up. But from that, it's all just spun off that for some reason, some goose had done something in the library and now we play off it with a number of stories that we actually tell and drip feed across. And people now talk back to us, ask us questions about it or kind of get questions. Well, what did happen? And we're always like, they know what they did. And I think the geese do know what they did. Another example, like as Patrick said, we've already mentioned, like we do make reference to knitwear in some respects. And this is where we're never quite sure how it's perceived. But for us writing it and our hope with it is that actually with how it contrasts to the rest of our content, showing that librarians aren't cardigans, it's not dusty books on shelves. We're not just shushing. There's a whole much more to it that it actually works to kind of subvert this stereotype and the kind of content around that. And a lot of this, again, it's not like we sat in the meeting room and thought, you know what, we're going to talk about cardigans and really going to run with it or jumpers. I think it came from a photo we posted of Patrick wearing a particularly resplendent jumper that received a few compliments. And we just kind of ran with it from there. And from the examples we've got on there, it's not like we're just throwing out a tweet about cardigans. We're folding it into promotions of databases, some of our services, talking about what um, I think there was the tweet we've got here about things that don't annoy librarians or students asking for help. But one of the things that does annoy us is substandard knitwear. And so, again, it's the idea that we're drip feeding these over a period of time. It's people that are then relating to, they're recognising and they're buying into this kind of community and um, personality. One of the other things we're lucky to have at Royal Holloway is the Founders Building, which is the original college building from the 1880s, built in the lovely French Renaissance style. Now, not just because of lockdown, but actually just in general, we want people to be proud of the campus, to have a sense of belonging there and have this shared identity. And so one of the things that we've done is to basically try and showcase the beauty of campus and the Founders Building. The way we did this, rightly or wrongly, was we actually, as the library account, we flirted with the founders building. And that's the way we kind of did it. We played it like we had a crush on the building. So founders, you scoundrel, look at you stealing our hearts again. We played it like that as a way of showcasing the building, kind to get people. And what would actually happen is people would respond with their own photos, their own comments on it as well, and buying into this kind of idea of sense of belonging in the community. One of the things as well that we've been deliberate with this, and you can slightly tell from some of the examples we've got here, is we were mindful of the time of year we were posting and also the time of day. So for winter, we've got our snowy pictures, we've got some great autumnal ones. If we we're posting the picture in the evening, we wanted to be like a sunset picture in the morning, a sunrise picture. We tried to make the photo relevant to the time of day and the year that we were posting. 
The last example in terms of reoccurring themes and content I'm going to share here because I'm very aware of time is kickstalls. With the kickstalls, I'd love to say that there was some sort of layer and thinking behind this, but actually we just thought the idea of sentient kickstalls would be really funny. So we played a number of tweets running through um, over the last year or so that they're roaming around wild in the library. One of the advantages that we've had with this is we've been able to run it as if it's some sort of live event or story that's happening. And so people can then kind of engage and share in that as well as it's occurring. Yeah, so on a slightly more serious note than sentient kickstalls, um, another one of the main techniques that we've used to try and cultivate a digital, a digital community amongst our followers is through storytelling. Um, by this we mean sharing narratives uh, unique to the library, our collections, and the history of Royal, Royal Holloway that we think will resonate with our followers, um, particularly obviously Royal Holloway staff and students. Um, by illuminating a shared history and college identity, which we hope they connect with. Um, so one example of this is uh, since the beginning of last year, we've done a weekly archives at home post um, where we basically share a kind of range of historic photos from our archives of life at Royal Holloway in Bedford College uh, way back when. Um, and the initial idea behind this was to bring the history of the college into the living rooms of our students who were, who were probably missing the experience of being on campus and visiting our archives at that time. Um, but we've continued this even as students have slowly returned to campus because it's been very popular. Um, we usually caption these in a bit of a daft way. Uh, for example, you can hopefully see the tweet there. Uh, lecture theatre claiming quite controversially that Squirtle is the best starter Pokemon. Um, but often we kind of just play it straight as well and let the photo speak for itself, um, like recently when we've exper experimented with colorizing some photos from our archives. Um, another example of this uh, kind of storytelling with the history of the college is a thread we did about Winifred Seville, who was a student at Royal Holloway in the 1900s, whose diaries we're lucky enough to have in our archives. Um, in these diaries, she actually describes uh, several same sex relationships she had with other students at that time, um, as well as some of just the more mundane aspects of daily life at, uh, as a student at Holloway at a time when it was still an all women's college. So really, uh, we saw this as an opportunity to reiterate the proud origins of Royal Holloway as an all women's college, uh, with which most of our followers already strongly identify whilst also uncovering a hidden story of, of LGBT life, uh, which they'd most likely never heard of before and maybe even surprised them a little bit. So to wrap up here, I think the most important thing with these narratives and this kind of storytelling about the history of, of the college is that it's something which is unique to us. Um, they re reveal a positive history of the library uh, and as such, they're not something that could be easily replicated by another account. I'm very aware of time and I don't want to infringe on uh, Amy, our next speaker, too much. So I'm going to kind of whistle stop through this next bit and between me and Patrick, try and wrap up quite quickly with our kind of closing thoughts. But the last kind of thing that we've been, well, not the only last thing we've been doing, but another example I want to show you here is kind of number of this kind of what we call library stories that we write as well in terms of not just the college, not just our specific library, but libraries in general about the services we do the work we do and kind of moving away that we're a physical building and it's books on shelves and that's all libraries are. You may or may not be aware of a thread we did that we kind of called the lonely book thread, which is about a book that hadn't been borrowed in ages that we then took on a date around the library. The vehicle being to kind of showcase the services we had and good etiquette with looking after books. But from that and trying to kind of tap into that kind of wholesomeness and the sentimentality that came from it. We then talked about that library uh, library search website and the usage of that, which showcased its use across the world through different time zones and kind of celebrated the internationality of our student body. And again, like the story and how it wraps up was putting our students and our users at the centre of it. We did a thread where we compared libraries to it like an onion, which a little bit of a Shrek reference as well, but the whole idea that there's layers to it, that there's the building on the outside, then all of the support, the services, the things that don't always get talked about. And then at the heart of the onion was our users. Another example as well was a locker key that was actually our fifth most borrowed item of 2020, go figure. 
But we then use that to kind of tell a story of the students and the people who were using that locker key, the reasons why they had it, why it was so borrowed and the kind of idea then that it's not our books who tell the most important stories, it's our users. And all of this was kind of wrapping together this whole idea that it's positive, wholesome messaging, this whole idea of a community that people can buy into, that they're at the centre of, that we're promoting on our social media account. Yeah, so what are some of the lessons we've learned since we started running the account? Uh, well, for starters, we found it can be quite difficult to judge success. Um, for us, ultimately, success on social media can only re really be quantified on its own terms, i.e. by a number of followers, likes, etc. Um, and if you do well, that usually means reaching beyond the kind of narrow scope of your initial target audience. Uh, and this comes back to Orkney, you know, as we mentioned earlier, Orkney Library, one of the most popular public library accounts on Twitter. Um, has 70,000 followers more than trouble is the actual population. Uh, so their social media has been a great success in its own right because it's broken out of that initial target audience and reached far beyond it. And you might ask, you know, why would we want to reach people beyond our, our users, our students, our, our target audience, which is a fair question, but we mostly see it as an opportunity to teach people about libraries and their role in education and society. Uh, it's a chance to show people that we're more than just shushing and shelving, as Greg said. Um, the other thing is you can't predict what will do well um, for all of the examples we just showed you. Some are kind of the more popular things that we did. Um, there were dozens of things that weren't popular or just didn't quite work for whatever reason. Um, and it's usually a case of just trialing certain ideas, seeing what works, running with it and pretending whatever didn't work never happened. Um, and obviously with this in mind as well, it's important to have realistic expectations. You know, we can't all be Orkney as much as we'd like to be. So instead, we just aim for gradual improvement and a consistent engagement with our followers to kind of build a, a digital community around our accounts. I think one of the other things as well is like we talked at the beginning about how we wanted to be perceived. We wrote a strategy document about how we define our personality. But at the end of the day, it's something that is going to organically evolve over time. And that's something that you need to let happen, especially as we're saying it's rooted in the people writing the content who may leave, may go into the job roles. And you need to kind of kind of gradually build that continuity and reliability into it. As Patrick said, there is a lot of stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor or just didn't work. And so it's picking out what does and kind of running with it in a sensible way. And so just let it grow, let it be organic, let it evolve over time. The next point I'd say is like, don't just stick to calendar days. Like there's some really good calendar events such as Black History Month, Mental Health Awareness Week, it's Pride Month at the moment as well. And yes, we want to mark those events, but we also want to be talking about those kinds of topics all year round as well. We don't just want to talk about LGBT history and topics during Pride Month. So we're going to promote our resources, reading lists and information we have around that all year round. The same with race and intersectionality and the same with self-help and mental health as well. We've got a good kind of promotion and collaboration. We do with some reading lists and resources with our wellbeing team. And these are things that Mental Health Awareness Week is a great event, but that doesn't solve mental health. Talking about constantly drip feeding these messages throughout the year is something we very consciously want to do. The last thing I'll say here is the hook. And this is something we've learned about how actually we write content. And if you've been reading some of the kind of examples we've shared, quite often we have what we call the hook, which is the setup, something that is an opening sentence gambit or whatever you want to call it, that hooks people into the content. And quite often it's something that's only tangentially linked to what we actually want to talk about, because after the hook comes the meat, the actual message, what we want them to know, followed by a takeaway. And that's something that not all tweets are like that, but we're mindful of how we're going to get people to engage with this. What do we want them to know and what are they going to take away from it? Yes, yeah, so in terms of writing content as well, we have found that it's best that content should be collaborative. Uh, obviously, we don't mean having like a roundtable discussion for every single thing that you're going to uh, uh, post. Um, but as Greg mentioned, uh, allowing the personality of the account to evolve over time and part of that is writing content collaboratively so that what you're sharing feels like it's coming from the organic personality of the account itself, rather than just the kind of particular style of humour of the individual writing that uh, post. 
Um, and also another advantage I found of, of doing it collaboratively is that when I've had rubbish ideas, Greg's been able to kind of gently dissuade me. Um, uh, finally, as well, I think it's just important to have fun with it and try not to take it too seriously. I think as well, there's a special mention that there is a comms team behind you as well, that while me and Patrick predominantly post on Twitter, our excellent colleague Claire does our Instagram. Uh, ben, who I think might be in the event even, actually he writes some great content. And I think as other people have mentioned in their talks as well, there's some senior management oversight just to make sure we're staying on message for what that is. Um, yeah, so uh, so as we said earlier, um, we have a kind of set idea of how we want the library and uh, the account to be perceived, um, but obviously we don't actually know for certain how people think of our account. So in anticipation of this talk, um, we asked our followers to tell us honestly what they thought about our account. Uh, as, uh, as you can see, there's some lovely superlatives in there, you know, engaging, uh, uplifting, giggle worthy, um, that really match what we aim for with the personality of the account. Uh, but for us, the most positive thing is that a lot of these comments suggest that we're really striking the balance we aim for between being wholesome and witty with genuinely informative and engaging. And, you know, people come to our account to be kind of signposted to our services and resources, but also mostly they come here to engage with our account and feel like they're contributing to a, a friendly digital community. Um, and that's the thing, you know, our followers do often engage with us, um, particularly over the last 12 months, you know, our engagement has gone up and up and up, uh, whether that's kind of people tweeting directly at us or replying to us or talking to us. Um, but on that note, we thought we'd leave you with our favourite piece of feedback, which I think we've ever received, um, which sums us up perfectly. These effing nerds. I'm going to pass over to Amy Lewin from the University of Liverpool Library, whose talk Promoting Belonging and Connectivity by Building an Engaged and Active Community on Social Media. Um, so just while it loads, I'll just kind of give a bit of a brief introduction to who I am. And um, I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with University of Liverpool Library Twitter predominantly. So I'm Amy, I'm Marketing and Engagement Officer for Libraries, Museums and Galleries at the University of Liverpool. So that encompasses not only the library and the library's social media, the library's general marketing activity, uh, but that also covers our museums and galleries. So that's the Victoria Gallery and Museum, uh, the Garstang Museum, it covers our um, academic skills department. So that's our know-how team, our special collections and archives. So yeah, there's, there's quite a lot to it and um, we're a small team. So I'll get started and I'm sure you'll, you'll understand a little bit more. So, yeah, as I say, I'm Marketing Engagement Officer. Um, it, it's a pretty varied and a pretty big role. We are a really small team um, and we're quite a new team. We've only been in existence in the past sort of 18 months to two years. And previous to that, there was no sort of uh, marketing or comms team within the library. So I'll just give you a quick overview of what I'm going to cover today. So I'm going to talk a bit about background. So kind of uh, where the social media kind of started in the library, what it was like before, um, and then kind of how we've developed it to create a purpose for our use of social media, really looked into who our audience is and how we can best uh, communicate with them and provide content that they enjoy, um, and audience um, in terms of like the different audiences on different social media channels. Um, I'll talk a bit about our channels that we use, why we've chosen to use them, why we've not chosen to use others, because I think that's really interesting because um, we're not necessarily the same as some of the previous speakers today, so I think it's interesting to get that um, other perspective. Um, how we kind of audit or you know regularly look up other, other accounts or the universities, content that they're producing, and how that feeds into our strategy and what we do uh, as a team. Uh, our posting guidelines, so generally kind of what our approach is to social media, how we plan and how we evaluate. So just to begin with, I'll uh, talk a little bit about the background. So I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar. Um, if you're familiar with us at all, it will probably be with uh, the infamous cheese tweet. Um, so this tweet was by someone in our customer services team, actually, when we didn't really have a specific dedicated marketing or comms team or function. And it was a team made up of, you know, kind of just different people working within the library whose 
you know, main role wasn't social media, but they did it kind of as a part of their role. And as much as I'm sure he would love me to say that it was really well thought out and planned in advance, it was just an off the cuff tweet that I don't think anyone expected to do as well as it has done. Um, we still get notifications to this day with people bringing it back up, sharing it again, commenting, mentioning. So it's just this piece of evergreen content that is just always out there in the Twitter sphere and will really kind of just get um, engagement for us all year round when we're not really expecting it. Um, but some of our other kind of tweets that you may have seen, you know, I'm sure you'll be familiar with a lot of them and going back years, there's always been kind of those, that similar um, kind of, witty and almost sarcastic tone throughout Twitter so I, I'm sure you're quite familiar with it so moving on I'm going to be still talking about our Twitter but also how we've developed our strategy and our approach to social media to really um kind of move into other channels and develop our voice and our presence in other channels and kind of create that same level of, su of success that we found on Twitter so before I kind of came into my role there was as I say no dedicated resource for not only social media, but kind of marketing and communications in general, it just didn't exist. Um, and yeah, the, the, the library decided to create a function in myself and my manager who are kind of, as I say, responsible for marketing for the libraries and the museums and galleries. Um, and although we had a strong Twitter presence, it wasn't necessarily used to our full advantage. And I think that there were some really good you know, personalities and really good humour within that, but it didn't always necessarily translate into us using that reach that we had to kind of support our library activity and engage with our users in terms of providing them with kind of the information that they really needed and that we wanted to communicate. So we've definitely tried to harness that a little bit better. Uh, Instagram was used really sporadically. It didn't really have a clear purpose we didn't know who we were talking to on Instagram it was just kind of similar to what the others said about Facebook and um, it was kind of used in the same way that we had one because it was like well we probably should um but it's it was never something that was used kind of properly or with any real planning um and there was a lack of clear or consistent brand or message across all of our channels so they were again used as and when people had time but there was no real clear purpose and it wasn't necessarily clear um, from an outside perspective or to other people within the library, you know, what the aims of using social media were. So when I started, um, we kind of developed our, you know, reasons for why we want to use social media. So this took a lot of kind of looking at the different social media channels that we currently used, what they were currently used for and what we wanted to do to expand on that and develop our use of them to um, leverage them to support our other wider marketing games so again I think Ned mentioned earlier about not using social media as kind of a separate tool to your other communications and your other marketing it's important to kind of from my perspective remember that social media sits as a tool within that wider um, strategy so just again a little bit, about, little bit about me I'm not from a library background and um, my background is very much in marketing and communications so it was important for me that you know we were really looking at the whole picture of what we wanted to achieve and really have a holistic approach to what we wanted to do with our social media so some of our main reasons for using it are reaching engagement uh, with our users building positive relationships particularly throughout the pandemic uh, promoting our library services increasing our brand recognition and awareness of the library so this has also been a really useful one um for tying in kind of with uh, recruitment and the university's general marketing activity because obviously if the university has sub brands and you know departments that have a really strong and positive presence on social media it really does support their presence as a university and you know in in kind of the recruitment context if people are more aware of um the library as being you know some you know, an account that they're aware of or someone that's particularly funny or, you know, shares really useful information, it only helps to strengthen the university's overall um, kind of presence on social media. So that's also been really important for us. Um, extending the sense of the library community online, gaining user insights, again, has been really useful for us, you know, for gathering sort of informal feedback to different services, you know, finding out what students want and how we can um, help them, particularly throughout the pandemic. Uh, and engaging with other university departments and joint initiatives. So we've done a lot of this and developed a lot of really strong relationships with uh, the Guild of Students, 
uh, the careers department, the halls team, uh, just to make sure that we're really giving students the best experience on social media. So then we started to think about audience and one really interesting thing that we found was that our audience across the different channels wasn't necessarily who we thought it was and it, has, it is actually very different. So um, we kind of wanted to think about what age are, of users are on the different social media platforms that we're using? Um, where are they based? Are they actually based in Liverpool? Are they campus students? Um, are they people who are you know, based in America? Are they in different cities? It's definitely more difficult to get these analytics on Twitter and they're not actually available anymore, but we can get this breakdown for uh, our Instagram and our Facebook. And um, thinking about what the audience wants to see. So if our users are on Instagram, without even having to ask them, the likelihood is that they want to see a different type of content to what they would want to see on Twitter. And um, they may prefer to see, you know, nice images, uh, video content that they're not necessarily looking for on Twitter. And um, what do they want to know? What are their interests? So these are all really interesting things that I think, you know, for anybody who maybe doesn't have a social media account or uh, does have a social media account but just doesn't feel like they're getting what they want out of it and um, maybe really go back to the beginning to the basics and delve into these sorts of subjects and think about um you know who your audience is and who you're talking to so a brief breakdown of our instagram analytics um we currently have five and a half thousand followers on instagram which has been a growth of around 200% I think from in the past 18 months and it's grown significantly so when I took over this channel it was um I think we did a survey actually we just did like ask some questions in the library to students like what would you say about the library Instagram as it is now and we got kind of um some feedback like oh it, it makes me feel sad um oh it, it it feels like it's just got no soul oh it makes yeah it, I just don't like looking at it and it was just very you know, not the nicest images, not the nicest lighting, um, just kind of really ad hoc haphazard posts that just didn't really do anything. And personally speaking, I wouldn't follow on Instagram. So that was something we definitely wanted to focus on. How can we make this more kind of aesthetic and something that is going to want, you know, encourage our students to actually look at and focus on? Because, you know, we're not a campus university, but we do have really nice buildings, really nice spaces, you know, our libraries certainly are not the best looking libraries out of all of uh, those that I've seen on social media, but you can actually make them look better than they are. Um, so yeah, I do feel like it's it's definitely something to think about doing if you're thinking about improving your Instagram. Ask the students what their opinion is because um, yeah, they, they're brutally honest. Um, we also looked at kind of what the location is. So, you know, the majority of our followers are in Liverpool, um, and that's still the case um, even through the pandemic. Um, the number actually who are closer to London has increased quite a lot, whether that's just because we've got more students who are uh, working from home at the moment. Um, and our split is 60% women, 40% men, which again is quite kind of representative of the general split on, uh, split on Instagram, as far as I'm aware. So that's not really too surprising. We aim to do around three to five grid posts per week and stories pretty much five days a week, if not more. The reason being for this is that we find that stories are just such a way, a great way to keep people engaged. So basically, if you always have stories on your Instagram, so you never let them ex expire to the point that there's nothing there and there's just a little plus sign, there's always something on there for people, whether they see your story two days ago or not when they do actually go onto Instagram, you're likely to be at the top. Um, and this can really impact on the algorithm. So if even if people don't look at your stories all the time, the more people that are clicking on them and the more views that they're getting, the more likely you are to appear higher in their feed on Instagram and therefore get more engagement. So it's something we do really try and focus on. I mean, if we can add something in there that's got a poll or has got a question box and encourage people to actively engage as well, that's even better because obviously, again, once they've done that and they've engaged with your account, you're going to fare better in their algorithm on their feed. So, yeah, it's definitely worth doing. And um, we also find that our average engagement rate on Instagram posts is it's usually between around eight and 10 percent, which is significantly higher than sort of the average Instagram uh, engagement rate of one point six percent. So we if I get less than 100 likes on an Instagram post, like I am severely disappointed and it doesn't really happen now because we work really, really hard to um, kind of work on 
build in our feed so we have an aesthetic so if someone sees a post by us they will pretty much know it's the uni of uh, liverpool library we have if you go onto our feed a really consistent theme in terms of the editing of our photos are all really similar. We use similar lighting. We try to make sure that they're all quite bright. We don't use images that are of a poor quality purely because we know that the significance of that to, to people who are on the Instagram platform, it is predominantly a visual platform and to have success there, you've just got to um, kind of feed into that really. So yeah, it's, it's taken a bit of trial and error, but we do definitely get a really good engagement rate that I'm really pleased with. Um, so just kind of briefly, uh, the channels that we use are Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Um, so we use Twitter. Um, it is more fast paced. It doesn't necessarily always require quite as much planning. Um, but we have found that although, you know, obviously we do have a really good following and um, we still get really good engagement. It's no longer our sole focus for social media. We definitely have a greater focus in terms of planning and actually curating content for Instagram because it takes longer and actually the demographic on Instagram is more who we're aiming for. Uh, we found that a lot of the followers that we have on Twitter are either academics or the libraries and whilst it's great as Ned said earlier you know when we don't it's great to hear that other libraries find our content funny and they find it amusing, but it, it's not our aim. And if they don't, then it doesn't really matter to us. Um, you know, to get the odd tweet every now and then that gets a lot of likes and gets a lot of engagement and, you know, gets a lot of laughs, that's fantastic because it helps us to get further reach with the content that we actually need to reach our students. Um, but really, we don't actually find that our the majority of our undergrads are on there or that they don't necessarily engage with us on there that much. Um, we used to get a lot of uh, DMs through Twitter, you know, kind of questions about our services and things. We found that a lot of that has shifted over to Instagram now. So we get Instagram DMs constantly. Um, you know, is the library open? What are the opening hours? How do I book? And we do a lot of referrals through Instagram DMs over to our chat service on the website. So it's actually really interesting to see that that's where we're getting more engagement. Um, we also have separate Twitter accounts for our special collections and archives, uh, our academic skills team, which is know-how, and as I say, our, our uh, museums and galleries too. So we tend to engage with them quite a lot. Um, Instagram, I've already mentioned. Facebook, again, I mean, I'm kind of in two minds. I would love to just kill it also. It's not for me in my personal life or anything. But someone did actually mention in the group earlier about Facebook groups. Um, they definitely can be really good for engaging a younger uh, demographic. Tends to be that people, if they are going to use Facebook nowadays, they'll they'll join a group. So they'll join it for, I don't know, the purposes of um, there's a lot of graduate groups. So it might just it might be things like there's one called Girls Who Graduate. So it might be people who've just graduated university and they're looking for people in a similar position. So they might kind of chat in there. Um, yeah, so it might be that there's scope for you to use that. I know that our halls team use groups a lot to create groups for the different halls that we have, and they get lots of engagement. But other than that, there's not really any accounts across the university that would like, you know, shout about Facebook. Um, and another thing that was mentioned earlier was YouTube. Um, we don't actually use YouTube. We have an account which has existed since before my time. Um, it's just not something that we invest time into at the moment. And to be honest, I, I'm really OK with that. It's not something that I think would benefit us very much at the moment. We get really good engagement rates on Instagram. We do have a TikTok, um, which actually, to be fair, doesn't do too badly. We don't post as, not, as much as we would need to for it to really take off just purely because we don't have the time at the moment. Uh, but luckily, we do have um, quite a lot of customer services team who are willing to go on camera, do like funny things, funny dances. So I'm really lucky to have them. Um, but what we also do is we repurpose any content for TikTok on Reels on Instagram. So if you if you don't know about Reels, if you've not looked into Reels, then, you know, I really do think it's something to look at because basically the fear is, you know, we've got to have faces on camera. It's just not the case. A lot of our Reels that have done really well have been uh, content around the campus. It might even be filming a computer screen, but it's just those short, snappy videos. For example, it could be a really brief video of how to find um, the know-how service on the website and it's just a couple of clicks and rather than a lengthy YouTube video with someone doing a voiceover it's just kind of I don't think what our students want and therefore the snappy short videos on reels are actually um, 
a lot more engaging and a lot more absorbable. So I don't know about you, but throughout the pandemic, I think people have become very fatigued with consuming online, particularly video content. And I just think that anything longer than sort of the 30 seconds that younger people are used to on a TikTok video, it just goes over the heads and they move on. So I think you've just got to get your messages out there as quickly as possible. So that's my reason for not using a TikTok. Um, I know there'll probably be people who don't agree with me, but yeah, that's where we're at at the moment. We also then did an audit of kind of what other social media, um, like library social media were doing. Not only that, but also an audit of what the rest of our university accounts were doing. So it was important for us to kind of look at what other libraries did, but equally, we're not really in competition with other libraries. You know, if a student goes to our university, they're not interested in what another university library does. You know, that they don't, you know, they might not even be interested in what we do, never mind what another one does. So it was more important for us really to look at what the other departments in our university were doing and how we could collaborate with um, the students and um, kind of get students involved in creating content for us, collaborate with other departments to create content that will appeal more widely. So it might be that we do something with the Guild. Um, so we've done a lot of sort of um, collaboration with the Guild officers who've done work around um, like Black History Month and stuff like that. And we've done kind of giveaways on our Instagram where we've purchased books that the Guild officers have then run a giveaway and it's to kind of raise uh, awareness of certain issues so it's been really good at increasing our reach um, we've also looked at what other accounts and other libraries have done well um, and equally what they've not done well so there's a lot to learn I think you know kind of as Ned was showing you earlier about things that haven't done well it's really good to learn and, and you know when people are transparent about it it's really useful because you know not everything works so it's great to kind of get that feeling I think sometimes we will have people within the library who'll say like oh, such and such a library's done this, can we do it? And I'll kind of look and, you know, it might have done okay or it might have done really well even, but it just isn't our style. And I think that's really important to not jump on, jump onto every trend that you see. It doesn't necessarily work for you. So you don't have to do everything that everyone else is doing. And I think that's really important to learn. So just a kind of question for you to go away and think about when you're kind of talk, thinking about um, what you want your account to do. Think about an account that you follow. It doesn't have to be an academic account. It could be literally anyone. But why do you follow them? What do they offer you? And what do they do differently to others? So that's what you really need to think about and how you can build your own real personality um, and create something that the people who follow you actually want to see. OK, I'm going to delve a little bit more into Instagram. Um, for those of you who don't have an Instagram and don't intend to get one, this might be completely of no interest whatsoever. For some of you, you might think, yeah, we know all of this. But I do think it's really interesting to kind of dive into how to make a really successful Instagram account. So I'm going to cover a little bit, cover a little bit about consistency, relevance and engagement. And um, just to give you an idea of like the, the really good combination of all of those factors to get uh, good engagement. So uh, timing is a really important one. Can, um, it's not something that we think about too much now because we do have a really good engagement level. But initially, um, it's really important to think about the times that your followers are active on social media. So on Instagram, you can look at insights and you can actually see when your followers are most active. So if you don't have anyone online at eight o'clock in the morning, don't post at eight o'clock in the morning because there's not going to be anyone there. Um, equally, if your busiest times are at sort of six o'clock at night, you can schedule your content for that time and it's going to do better. So that's definitely something to think about. Uh, tone is also important, creating that consistent tone. I mean, I know we've talked a lot about that um, in other presentations today, but it's it's that identity where as soon as someone sees a post written in your tone, they know that it's you. Um, and I think that kind of having some content and tone guidelines are really important because if you're not the only person posting on social media, I think particularly Instagram, you want to have a consistent tone. I think with Twitter, you can get it away, get away with it a bit more because it can be more conversational and it could be sort of like, oh yeah, like that's a slightly different person that's posted that one particular tweet on that day. But with Instagram, the consistency of tone is important and it's not something that I think that should differ too widely. Um, content also, um, as I've mentioned before, so as you can see here, I don't know how well you can see that, uh, on the left is the 2021 um, feed of our Instagram, which is, as you can see, bright photos, um, a lot of it's sort of like campus buildings, the libraries, books, but all really well lit, very well framed. 
and then on the other side is before I took over and it's just kind of like a sewing machine uh, a photo like a couple of photos that I've got text on um just really kind of random things um that's something that personally I don't use on a grid feed on Instagram I would never use a photo with text on it's just not what I think is appealing on Instagram a lot of people will probably disagree with that but we've always done well without using them um, and if we ever want to put text on images we do that in stories um, and just creating a consistent look and feel as I mentioned before we've also been using reels so for example um, this was a reel that we made with some of our customer services staff and it was basically we just jumped on a trend of like people jumping out in and out of different shots so they were like jumping up the floors in the library um, and talking about um, the different noise levels in the library and it's it's gone down really well we did another one about um, kind of like the campus in general. So it's not always necessarily library focused, but it's always well received by our students. And then the posts that are about the library and the library services then get more traction and engagement and we reach more people. So it's having that really good balance of them all. And then relevance. So I kind of have touched on this earlier with audience, so I won't go too deeply into this, but basically it's is what you're posting on this channel relevant to the people who are on there or is it just relevant to you? Like, do you think it's interesting and do your colleagues think it's kind of interesting? Because if that's the case, but nobody else does, don't post it. It's not, a, it's not a platform for you. It's not a platform for your colleagues. It's not a platform for your boss. And, um, you know, just because, I mean, I've dealt with this quite a lot, just because your boss asks you for something or somebody else in the department asks you for something, you don't have to post it. You really don't. Um, and it can be difficult at first and I found it a little bit tricky coming from a marketing background and um, to kind of explain to people at times that actually that won't work but it's about encouraging those open and transparent conversations about actually this is why that piece of content won't particularly work on this channel but here's a suggestion for how it could work on another channel or a different way that we could portray it or maybe we could turn it around and make it less of like a negative comment or negative statement and turn it into something a bit more fun and engaging so those conversations are important and I think if you don't have them you end up just kind of putting out whatever you get asked and it just becomes very you know piecemeal and it doesn't really have any consistency so yeah I definitely think you need to think about who your audience is when you're posting um so we all yeah so we also then have um the kind of features within Instagram that I think you definitely need to be using so hashtags geotags and um, personally I don't ever like to use a hashtag in a caption unless it's just one and um, if I'm going to use kind of like 10 hashtags just to kind of increase reach and stuff like that I'd always put it in the first comment after the the post itself just because it looks less messy and um, definitely recommend doing that because it doesn't impact the reach of the the hashtags and it just makes your, po your post look really clean um, geotags as well, so location, so whether you tag the library itself, another university building, Liverpool City Centre, whatever it might be, helps for people to find your post, um, kind of people who are relevant to your uh, audience. Engage with, us, with other users and other accounts, so basically things like the features in Instagram stories are a really good way to engage. I would suggest that doing stuff too regularly can kind of make it feel a little bit like oh the library again oh I'm not going to do that but actually if it's something that's really engaging to your audience then it definitely does work and as I say it makes you become more visible in their uh, feed as well and then repurpose user or follower content this is something that I do all the time and um, a lot of our followers take far better pictures than we're able to they might be on campus at you know night time or very early in the morning on their way to a lecture when we're not there and they just take some really good photos, really good videos, and provided that you ask their permission to share it on your channel, there's absolutely no problem with that. And they also kind of, in doing that, you're building a relationship with them by saying, we absolutely love this photo, can we use it? If they don't already follow you, the chances are that they will. And um, it's just a really good way to build engagement again. Um, so, and, and finally, another thing that we do, which I've not mentioned there, is competitions and giveaways. Um, they've just been incredibly successful two years in a row now we've done a libmus giveaway and um, so the first year we did five days of libmus and then we did seven days of libmus and each day we had a different prize and um, students had to comment on the photo like it they had to tag a friend our followers just increased hugely during that time and it was just a really lovely way for us to engage with our students in a positive way particularly when we did it during the pandemic and um, we did some um 
prizes that we could send out to them or that they could collect from the library if they were there. So I definitely recommend doing that as well. Uh, so these are just some examples of kind of the engagement levels that we've got. So these specific examples are um, some throwback photos from our special collections and archives. And I wasn't actually sure how well they would do on Instagram because they're not actually, um, obviously they're current students and I didn't know how much they would relate to special collections and archives photos. However, we've been able to um, really collaborate with the Guild, uh, with our Halls team, with our alumni team, and the reach has been really, really good. And actually our students have found it really interesting to see what their you know, kind of predecessors looked like, what the buildings were like, what the halls were like. So it's been really good. Other things that we do, um, so for example, not, not the SCAR one, but the others are um, examples of user-generated content. So these are examples where we've said to a student, do you mind if we share your, um, your image on our social media? We give them credit always, but it also really generates some nice engagement for us. The other one was from, um, it wasn't a student, it was like Honey I Shrunk Liverpool or something, I think the account is, but they were wearing like little face masks. So at the start of the pandemic, we reshared that as kind of a way to reinforce the, you know, wear face masks thing. And it was in front of the Bombs Out Church in Liverpool. So it was really nice. Uh, some examples of some of the engagement stuff that we've done on stories. Um, when the building was closed last summer, I actually went in for a day and I thought, I want to do something that will kind of engage our students with the buildings because they can't be there. So we actually did um, a kind of request what you want to see in the library. And we were doing like requests for shout outs. And I should have actually done a screenshot of the responses that we got. We had so many requests for, can you take a photo of the chair in the you know ground floor, floor computer room and do a shout out to X person? And it was so nice. It was a really nostalgic feel. So we got a lot of that. We also did kind of like a, a, a 90s magazine style which study space are you quiz um what like we did a library bingo loads of different things like that that get loads of engagement so definitely recommend that uh planning as well so as i mentioned earlier we do um plan our content for instagram probably more so than twitter but we we plan all of it um but our plan for instagram is definitely done kind of on like a monthly slash every two week basis and obviously it changes as and when messages change but we try to have content planned in that we know that we don't have to then panic on the day what are we going to post um, and can, and make sure that it's always consistent with our key messages and um, I'd also suggest that a content calendar is really useful if you've got more people working on the social media so whether you use just an excel spreadsheet or you use some sort of google sheet trello whatever it might be whatever works for your team um, I definitely recommend doing that as well because it just also ensures that you're not repeating posts that you've done really recently. You can keep a track and you can also measure um, the engagement that you get. And then evaluating. So I know that there are some people who kind of struggle with getting resource for, for social media or for marketing. Um, and, you know, if it's just part of your job and you don't have anyone who's specifically there for it, I'd say that definitely using um, your, your metrics to prove the success of social media. So whether it's, for example, proving how many um, redirects you get from a particular post onto your website or to book a space on an academic skills workshop, um, you know, whatever it might be, you know, increase in followers or increased DMs engaging with the, the platform, use all of that as well as engagement rates to prove to your senior leadership or to your manager or whoever it is that actually it's having a real impact. Um, it's the best way to do it. It's what we do. It helps us to get, you know, sort of spend. It helps us to get um, all sorts of kind, like, kind of like allowances to do different things because they trust that it's working. So definitely showing them those things. Uh, particularly those people who don't really understand social media or marketing, it's really important. And then finally, just to finish, I just wanted to say, I know this has been a lot about Instagram, but we are we do still have a focus on Twitter. It's just a little bit more structured and actually it's had a really, really positive effect for us. We're not now in a phase of using Twitter where we're looking to massively grow our following. We've got a big following and actually, um, if we can grow our followers in terms of our undergraduate students, that's fantastic. But Unlike, I think what Greg said, we're not hugely bothered about becoming, you know, sort of like a famous library Twitter, um, or, you know, the world around. It's fantastic if we do. Um, and it's just an absolutely great kind of bonus of doing the job that we do on Twitter. But it's definitely not our main focus. You know, a lot of our kind of pretty, wholesome, um, 
university campus city content does really really well also our kind of informative content um has done a lot better on twitter for us having a really big following and high engagement rates so you know when our libraries are reopening all of our different services um, they do a lot better because we have the kind of positive base um but we haven't completely uh, moved away from our sort of more jokey tongue-in-cheek side um you'll probably know kind of similar to like the geese and the ducks and whatever else the the university of liverpool libraries um bird friend are our seagulls so our seagull content still gets a lot of engagement it's still really funny to be honest they are a nightmare uh, but we do still have that kind of tongue-in-cheek element to it as well it's just not our sole driver of our content and i think that um it's really important for us that it's kind of still in there but it, it doesn't kind of overtake everything else that we want to do so thanks for joining um i'll be happy to take any of your questions in the chat i hope that was useful um yeah i'll pass myself back to greg Thank, Thank you, you very, very, very much, Amy. That was fantastic. And I and I love a good cheese pun to finish on. Um, <laughs> it was brilliant with no apologies. Um, all right. I'm very aware of time, so I'm going to invite uh, the other speakers to turn their cameras and microphones back on and we'll jump straight into the kind of question and answer panel then. There's a few that we've collected from the chat as we've been going and please do feel free to add some more as we go. And the way we'll kind of do this is we'll kind of ask the question and bounce it through the different speakers and reverse the order. I always call it teams roulette as to whoever's top left of the screen gets to go first and we kind of rotate round from there. Uh, the first question I'm going to ask the panel then is, do you have any tips or advice on how to about how to go about growing followers on your social media accounts then? And going from the top left, actually, Patrick is up first with this, please needs to make sure your mute's brilliant. <laughs> um, I'm not sure in terms of, of general tips. I think we definitely found probably over the past year that we started to grow our followers a lot when we really encouraged people to engage with us. Um, you know, some of the posts kind of where we actually kind of directly encouraged people to kind of comment and reply. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Greg, but I think just in general, like really just encouraging people to actually engage with your account rather than just kind of passively sort of like and go, oh, that was good. That was funny. That was informative. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Natalie? Yeah, I would say have conversations with other people on Twitter and follow people and, you know, hopefully they'll follow you back. But yeah, make those connections with people and I think people will follow you. Mm -hmm. Amy? Um, yeah, I think very much similar. Um, I'd say leverage the the other accounts that your university has that have a big following. And um, you know, when we first joined, or when when I first joined, and our Instagram had a really poor following, I just basically begged Steph, our social media officer from the central team, to really push us through their central channel, and it did do a lot for us, um, as well as creating good content. So I just think building as many relationships as you can across the university um, is really useful and yeah just making sure your content's good and people will hopefully come brilliant and ned um i think it varies slightly by platform so on twitter i think it's all about just engaging people so I, I, we would never aim to gain followers what we do is aim to put engaging content out there and then the followers just happen on their own um so the, the way the algorithm works on twitter even people replying and liking your posts will end up in other timelines they don't need to be retweeted to be seen so basically we just try and do engaging stuff and then people will find it instagram is slightly different so i think tagging matters a lot in instagram because the search function in instagram is actually good unlike every other search function on anything ever so when you when you hit the little magnifying glass you will be shown posts that are like the stuff that you like so if you're tagging your post well as a library then there's a good chance of people coming across it and i also think weirdly like following accounts works well um on instagram and i wouldn't worry about it on twitter i don't i wouldn't I don't really think it matters too much who you follow on Twitter, but on Instagram, we've recently, thanks to my colleague Rebecca, just followed a load of York accounts that we weren't already following, loads of student societies and stuff. And that has just uh, brought an influx of followers. So the thing about that is what you want is the biggest possible audience for those important messages, like Amy was saying, you know, like, so it's not really an end in itself, but it's just about increasing the amount of engagement so that there's more people there so that when you do say something important, more people hear it, basically. Brilliant. 
All right. Um, next question then. And for the person who asked it, I'm going to apologise today because I'm going to fold it into another question as well to kind of put a bit more scope on it in terms of the question originally was, um, have you had to make a case to the respective kind of university management or library management to set up, well, Instagram account, but social media accounts? But I'm going to fold that in in terms of how have you found operating library social media accounts in the bigger purview of kind of colleges and universities and that kind of social media guidelines that they give. So I'm going to go in reverse order this time and start with Ned. Um, I think basically in terms of making a case for an account, the best thing you can do is um, use statistics to help back it up. So if you've got like uni access to Statista or something, there's so like you, you, Instagram is unquestionably by far the most important platform to a university library. It's just that there's so many of our people are there, right? So find the information to back it up, show them examples of either rival university libraries or, or comparable ones that are already doing it and show them the success that they've had with it. And the other thing is try and get in a room, even if it's over Zoom or Teams, you'll never persuade anyone to let you do something they don't want to let you do over email. It's, it's not possible. So you've got to make them feel bad about saying no by being face to face with them in, in one form or another. In terms of working with like the wider universities and so on, I think, again, the more conversations you can have that aren't just emails, the better. Um, and sometimes it's just about expressing empathy and accepting that central marketing teams are facing a different audience to you they're trying to recruit students and you're not so just having that conversation with them like i get why you don't want to do this but we're not actually aiming at the same thing that you are can sometimes help smooth things through brilliant thank you amy yeah i, I think similar i think you know kind of proven success from other institutions is really useful and also kind of putting together a proposal of what you will plan to use it for to reassure them that it's not going to be anything massively controversial and you know it, it has its own purpose in and of itself um i think there's definitely a case so i've done similar talks to this at our university for kind of other departmental um accounts and i think there's definitely a case that not all um university departments need an instagram account i think that a lot of them set it up and then it just kind of dies a death because they just don't know what to do with it i don't think there's always necessarily an audience for an instagram account for every department or team. That said, I think for a library, there's a lot you can do with it. And I personally don't know why, if you kind of could demonstrate the benefit that it can have that anyone would refuse. It's just, it's where the students are at from my perspective. So yeah. Brilliant. Natalie? Yeah, I'm just very similar, really. We never had to make a case. I mean, we just went ahead and set one up ourselves because we just wanted to. Um, so yeah, I guess it is, as Ned and Amy have said, um, pleading your case, maybe take a few photos and show examples of what it is that you might post and the sort of content that you'd want to do just to kind of put them at ease. Patrick? Yeah, again, I suppose I can only echo what the others have said. Um, I don't think we ever had to make a, a specific case for actually having a, a social media account or platform, but um, I think there's been not necessarily pushback, but perhaps if I say sort of uh, confusion around some of the more kind of whimsical content that we put out maybe. But I think, yeah, like we have the analytics, we can show that this does make our account more popular, it gets more engagement, uh, it helps basically. And I think having that to actually justify what you're doing and why you're doing it uh, definitely helps. Brilliant. Next question then was a bit about the logistical management of the accounts that how do you or if you even do monitor accounts out of hours and um, if we start with Amy on this one please. Oh sorry mind problems and um, yeah this is this is quite a difficult one and um, I think we're lucky in that you know I am employed as well not just social media as you know you might think but kind of the whole marketing function across libraries museums and galleries so i do a lot of the actual you know planning content creating posting everything myself but we also make it quite clear on our uh, platforms that our dms are not monitored 24 7. it's just something that we have like in our bio on instagram we have it on twitter um and we make it very obvious that our chat service is available uh, during those times and it's just a case of you pick it up as soon as you can um Generally, we find as a library and with museums and galleries, there's never anything, you know, massively, you know, urgent out of hours. So it's not too much of an issue. However, um, when kind of things began during 
um, the onset of lockdown, there were a lot more questions and worries and things like that out of hours. And we did actually allocate um, time and resource to having people just available if needed. It was something that kind of I was happy to do on sort of a, a voluntary um, kind of basis. We tend not to use uh, automated responses on social media. We, we just don't use them. Um, I quite like that very personal uh, feel to respond kind of by a member of staff. So, yeah, that's what we do. Brilliant. Thank you. Natalie, next, please. Yeah, um, yeah. so we, we make clear that we're not always available and we will push people towards our website so that they can do chats or they can email, phone, etc. Um, but I do have all the apps and things on my phone, so I will get a little ping to say that there's something. Uh, most of the time I will answer, no matter when it is, depending on the question. Uh, I think it's really hard not to when, you know, when someone has asked a question there and then. Um, but yeah, try not to it the weekend necessarily, but maybe sometimes in the evening, I'll just go, oh, this will be really quick. I can just do it on my phone. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I think I'm also guilty of the kind of, oh, what's that message? And it's only 8 p.m. and I'm supposed to be watching Netflix, but <laughs> <laughs> move aside, put that aside. Uh, Patrick next. Um, yeah, same really. Um, we don't have a kind of rotor for monitoring messages outside of ours. Um, as Greg said, I know we both have a distinctive lack of social life, so we probably will respond to um, DMs um, more than we should outside of ours. But yeah, we make it really clear that, you know, as a first point of call, students are always pushed to kind of towards the live chat outside of ours and we pick it up as soon as we can, basically. Brilliant. Ned? Uh, I'm going to go slightly against the grain here. I, I would highly recommend just never having any notifications about work stuff on a phone and, and not doing anything out of hours because otherwise it sets up expectations that you're going to continue to do that. And I think for just from a kind of burnout point of view, you know, librarianship is pretty bad for people being really too passionate about it. And we don't need to be answering stuff when we're not at work. It's definitely not worth it. That's my personal view. So we, I mean, for example, one of my colleagues does work on a, the, uh, occasional Saturdays who does social media stuff. And when she started doing social media stuff, we did discuss the fact that we didn't want her to do stuff on the Saturdays because that would set up an expectations that we do out of hours stuff on weekends, which we don't, we couldn't necessarily keep up. So we, we basically stick to it. The only difference, the only thing I'll, I'll break that rule with is if I just see something really nice in York I might take a picture of it and post it to Instagram but I won't be like on there responding to messages so I think it's just about user expectations just set like um, Amy said just push people towards the chat and then and just uh, make it clear that it's not something that they can expect to get that kind of after five o'clock or Saturday and Sunday type service from. Thank you and um, next question I want to ask then is is there a situation where things haven't quite gone as expected and what lessons did you learn from that then? So I'm going to start with Natalie on this one then. I think uh, the, the Taskmaster competition that I mentioned in Welcome, we didn't really get that many responses, which was really disappointing because we could put a lot of effort into it. Um, I'm not sure what we can learn from that. It's maybe MMU students just weren't in that mind frame. It's been a very you know strange academic year. Um, so I think we we tweak it and we try and do something different from welcome this time, but it is just learning. Oh, okay, well that didn't work. So what what can we do slightly different to make it a bit better next time, or just abandon it completely? <laughs> Thank you, um, Ned. Next, please. Um, well, I, I put a couple in in my presentation. I, I think the main the one that I found most interesting was the um, the safety campaign around COVID protocols with the masks, where we were using the duck and the cat and stuff, because we'd taken a, a deliberate decision to, to do something that was risky there in that it's a very serious thing, the pandemic, and we, we've got a picture of a duck wearing a face mask. Um, and and we've taken the decision to do that because you cannot get the same message to be listened to if it's not said in a different way after, at this point, it was like 10 months in, you know, everyone was so oversaturated, you just simply cannot. So I think that in, when it comes to safety messaging, clear consistency is very important and very good, but we, we made a decision to not do it for this because we thought it was the only way that we could get anyone to rethink their position if they hadn't already done so. So we did it and it and actually we had an original plan where our, our libraries, like most libraries, they're named after dead dead white men, the dead white men library. So we were going to have pictures of the dead white men with the masks on. But then it turns out that there was like relatives of them who potentially might not like that. So we, we then we moved to the ducks and we had like 
the Mona Lisa. We had all kinds of people with masks on. And, and, then, and then this thing, as I said, came up where the staff on the ground weren't comfortable with it. Um, and I totally understood why. So I, I basically made sure that they understood why we made the decision to do it in the first place, that it wasn't just a kind of unthinking thing, that we made a deliberate choice. But then, as I say, we did then stop it. You know, it was going well, but we didn't do it. So I think that's an interesting thing about just generally being responsive to, you know, like Amy saying, not doing stuff in a bubble um, and being responsive to what's going on in kind of real time and being able to change direction. And it was sad for me because I had some great stuff lined up, but I think it was the right thing to do. Um, so sometimes it's just about making sure that the rest of the institution is on board with what you're doing and not doing something that's going to potentially upset anyone. Thank you. Uh, Patrick? Um, yeah, I suppose the main example of things not going well for us, um, probably a, a little bit over a year ago, um, we did a kind of short thread um, kind of outlining our intention, our commitment to decolonizing uh, our collections, um, or at least beginning that process, um, which received quite a backlash from a certain demographic of Twitter. Um, which, you know, initially was just really unpleasant to, to read this kind of constant deluge of, of negative comments. Um, but I think we kind of took a step back and we kept perspective. You know, we do have a kind of specific strategy that when there's things like this that are kind of, you know, not relevant or harassment, we kind of ignore it. We don't engage. We don't backtrack. Um, and yeah, I think we kept perspective in terms of like the actual content of the tweet itself you know we we still stand by that we weren't embarrassed by that at all um and the actual people that it was going to affect i kind of you know students and staff are at holloway the reaction was mostly positive so yeah i think in that instance it was just mostly about kind of retaining a, a perspective I think the one lesson we maybe learned that I'd add to that as well was sometimes there's language that we use within the profession that we know what we mean by it. But when you're talking to an audience that this is where we realise the audience outside of library Twitter, you might serve yourself by defining what you mean, perhaps better than what we did do, even though we stand by what we said. Um, Amy? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we've probably had quite a few examples. One I was going to mention was an Instagram one, actually, which was just a bit of a learning curve for us, really. I mentioned earlier that we've done quite a few kind of competitions and things which have really helped to grow our following and engagement. But the first one that we ever did was um, it was like a photo competition. So we asked people to um, like post and tag us in um, a photo that they took on campus or of the libraries and we got maybe four or five entries. And what we actually learned from that is people don't necessarily want to engage with posting content on their own Instagram feed to kind of enter a competition. People's Instagram feeds, can, like it's a reflection of them. And a lot of people don't want to clog up their feed with doing stuff like that. So we kind of shifted. And the next competitions that we've done since have been more, you know, like a like our, like our picture, tag a friend, tell us what your favorite Christmas film is, whatever it might be. And that increases engagement, it builds followers, but it doesn't require people to do something on their own page that we found that they just don't want to do. So that's a good tip. If anyone's thinking of doing that, you might not get a lot of uptake. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you very much. I'm aware of time, so I'm afraid we're gonna have to bring it to a close at this point. I know there's a couple of questions still from the chat that we've not managed to get round to. So I'm just gonna say that there is a survey link I'm just going to put into the chat now, which would be really grateful if people can fill out. And there is the opportunity on there to add in any questions that you did want answered that haven't managed to be covered during the question and answer here. I'm going to pause at this point to give a very sincere thank you to all of our speakers today. They've given up their time to plan these and deliver them and kind of do the question and answer as well. So from me and hopefully the rest of the attendees, thank you very, very much for your time. The talks have been brilliant, in my opinion. I've really enjoyed listening to them. And for myself, there's a lot that I've learned and I hope for the people listening as well, that's been the case. We'll have the recording hopefully sent round to people. Um, I'm hoping by the end of the week, but I'm a bit reluctant to put uh, an exact time on it because I want to check captions and everything. It's quite been quite a long event, um, but, I think at this point, thank you very much for everyone attending. Thank you very much again to our speakers. I can see there's a lot of lovely comments coming in the chat. So I'm just going to kind of drip feed the survey link in again because that seems to be getting bounced up. But um, 
again, have a nice day, everyone. And it's been lovely speaking to you all.